You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 366, Revelation 4, part 1. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Mike Heiser. Hey, Mike, what's going on? You know, I, I guess you guys, are, are you still getting any kind of cold weather? I mean, a few weeks ago, it was like the Arctic there. We we didn't get that. It just feels like I moved at the right time, I guess. But how, did. How, how, how's everybody doing? Texas was uh, colder than parts of Alaska there for a little bit. And uh, where I'm at, we got almost 15 inches of snow in one day. And yes, I am in Boy. Texas, West Texas. And we got... It, yeah, it, well, our, hopefully our, there won't be another one. Yeah, yeah, knock on wood. But uh, us Texans, we made it through. You know, now it's March and it's warm and you're ready to yeah, work you're on gonna, the tan. You're going to have to... Yeah, but you're, you're, you'll probably spend most of the rest of the year suffering through the all the talk about what caused it and what to do and all that kind of stuff. So you guys will be the focus for a while. I'm just glad to be in Florida. What can I say? Yeah, I'm jelly. What can I say? Have you gotten in your pool yet? Yeah. Uh, no, no, but Calvin has, the pugs have, I don't, Norman did anyway, you know, so he, he's, he just makes us nervous. You know, when he's, he sees Calvin going in, it's like, Oh, okay. You know, maybe I'm not scared. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. more could care less. You know, he's just like, where, where, where's the location of my next nap? Yeah. He, he knows how to float. Yeah. Well, he didn't learn it like, from you. It's only between five and six feet at the, at the, the deep end, so yeah, he can stand in it. You know, ironically, we took we had all the kids do swimming lessons, you know, so they they should be okay. Oh, that's good. That's a that's an important life skill, Mike. You got everybody should learn how to swim. That's what I hear. Yeah, you need to learn how to <laughs> swim. Maybe you can get them to teach you how to swim, and then please film yeah. that for all of us to watch because that would be. Oh yeah, yeah, I'll gold. get right on that. That'd be gold. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I know what I'm doing this weekend. No. <laughs> yeah. All right, Mike. Well, <laughs> hey, we had a nice two-week break from Revelation. Yeah. Today we're we're going to do Revelation four, but it's only part one. Um, you know, this we're we're going to hit stretches like this too, where there's just something that's sort of lurking behind the backdrop of a chapter, or that we have to sort of cover first, and that's going to set up you know some of the drill down stuff. So. You know, today we're going to look at, at Revelation 4 and get our feet wet there. And again, what we're doing in this series is it's all about the use, the repurposing of the Old Testament in the book of Revelation. And today we're going to see how John repurposes an Old Testament genre. And that is called in Old Testament scholarship the covenant lawsuit genre. It's also known as the covenant lawsuit treaty. So there, there's a lot of scholarship uh, behind this. There's a, there's a pretty solid consensus of scholarship, in fact, that Revelation 4 and 5 is a divine council scene that utilizes features of the covenant lawsuit genre from the Old Testament. So today, we want to be talking about what that genre is, what are the elements. And, and once we go through the elements, you're going to kind of see, if you think about Revelation 4 and 5, that yeah, you know, the chapter does kind of like unfold in this particular way. And that's going to inform certain items in these chapters, uh, it, basically how to read them. Or this is the bigger picture, Old Testament bigger picture. Here's what, what, what the passage is accomplishing. And then there's this other thing over here that's a little more, you know, nuanced or drilled down into a specific passage that John, you know, might might use or repurpose. Uh, in in part two. So, you know, it, this is going to be fairly broad, this episode. Now, we've had on the show before Alan Bandy, and I'm going to be interacting with three sources here, really using three sources. They're all dissertations, and they've all been since, you know, I'm sure revised in some way and published into expensive books. So, so I'm going to be using the dissertations. I'm, I've uploaded all three of these dissertations into the protected folder uh, for the podcast. So if you want you know, to, to get a hold of the original dissertation and not the published book, you can do that. 
And so any, any page number I refer to here is going to be on, you know, about the dissertation, not the book. But Bandy's dissertation is one of these. And again, we've had Alan Bandy before uh, to talk about his work. And so we're going to sort of revisit parts of that. And then I'm going to add a few other things from, from some other sources. So Bandy's dissertation was entitled The Prophetic Lawsuit in the Book of Revelation. This is his PhD dissertation from Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary in 2007. He is going to reference an older dissertation a lot. I mean, he references a number of works, but one of them is, is a dissertation by R. Dean David. And the title of that one was The Heavenly Court Scene of Revelation 4 and 5. This was a PhD dissertation done at Andrews University in 1987. And the third source that uh, I'll draw on is Myra Kensky. Her dissertation was Trying Man, Trying God, subtitle The Divine Courtroom in Early Jewish and Christian Literature. This is a University of Chicago dissertation from 2009. And I should add that her work actually includes a chapter on rabbinic literature too, even though the title you know, doesn't make that completely evident. Because when you see early Jewish, you think Second Temple Judaism, not rabbinics, but, but she actually has a chapter on rabbinics as well. So I'm going to be interacting with all three of these to sort of explain, you know, what is the covenant lawsuit genre and how, how does it show up in Revelation 4 and 5? Uh, and, and to be honest with you, you know, there are, there are scholars that would argue that, that the whole book of Revelation draws on this genre in a number of respects. But we'll, we'll, we'll drift off into that a little bit, but we're going to maintain our focus here on these two chapters. So what I want to start with Bandy's, you know, dissertation, what, what he does again, he, he is going to, you know, as, as sort of the title indicates the prophetic lawsuit in the book of Revelation. I mean, his dissertation is not isolated to chapters four and five. So he's going to, he's going to, in his dissertation, show how the prophetic lawsuit this covenant lawsuit genre is utilized and repurposed in various places in the book of Revelation. So what he does in his dissertation is he begins with discussing all the literature that has gone before, you know, the, the, the work that has been put into the prophetic lawsuit genre, and then noting specifically writers as well that dip into the book of Revelation for this here and there. And then his, his work's really going to expand on the theme and really give it concerted attention specifically in the book of Revelation. So he goes through, you know, in his introduction, lots of different approaches to this. So it's very evident that, that there's, there's some kind of covenant or treaty or lawsuit background. Like when, when you hear lawsuit, think a courtroom scene, all right? You know, Bandy points out, you know, scholars have noticed this for a very long time. The only question is, well, which, you know, which genre or which ancient Near Eastern, you know, genre or examples are, are the best ones, you know, to really understand what's going on here. So he goes through all these different options in his early chapter, and he notes, you know, strengths and weaknesses of a bunch of them. Uh, for instance, he, he, when, when he, when he veers into Revelation, he refers to David Chilton's work. Uh, Chilton, it was a, it, I don't know if he, I, I presume he's still living, is his, his book that Bandy spends a lot of time on is Days of Vengeance, an exposition of the book of Revelation, which was 1987, so it's not that old. But anyway, Chilton is sort of in the Christian theological arena. Uh, he's eschatologically, he's a preterist. In that arena, you know, Christians who do eschatol eschatology, he's one of the, the few that really spent a lot of time on this covenant framework for the book of Revelation. So he spends a lot of time, uh, Bandy does, you know, talking about Chilton and, you know, again, strengths and weaknesses, you know, some critiques here and there. One of his critiques of Chilton is that he depends a lot on Meredith Klein's uh, articulation of covenant elements that we should be paying attention to. And, you know, Klein wrote, wrote earlier, you know, than the 1980s. And so, you know, some of, some of that work is going to suffer because it hasn't been brought up to date. Again, this is just a, cr a chronological issue. Uh, but, you know, to, to be more specific, on page 38, Bandy writes this. He says, the five points of the covenant structure, this according to Chilton, include one, a preamble to identify the king, a historical prologue, that's number two. Number three is ethical stipulations, in other words, the terms of the covenant. 
Four, sanctions outlining blessings and cursings. And five, succession arrangements dealing with future generations. And so he talks about how, you know, Chilton views the, the, the backdrop of the book of Revelation as essentially uh, a lawsuit against Israel, against Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. And that, that, that's going to lead him in a certain direction in, in interpreting the book uh, that, you know, fits really nicely in, in the preterist camp. Bandy writes, Chilton views the covenant lawsuit describing the last days of the covenantal nation of Israel, which was fulfilled with the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. And then he writes, Chilton's approach, however, differs from most scholars in that he arrives at the lawsuit through his covenant framework for revelation instead of through the occurrences of juridical language and imagery. This results in part from the fact that his commentary is an exposition of the English text rather than the Greek. Likewise, Chilton argues that Revelation does not contain a prophetic lawsuit, but it is a lawsuit based on the five-point structure of ancient Near Eastern covenants. And he gets that from Klein. The problem with this thesis is that he overstates his case for the covenant framework serving as the structure for Revelation. And then elsewhere he says, to say that the entire book of Revelation intentionally follows the structure of ancient Near Eastern vassal treaties proves difficult to validate. Let me just stop there. So what Bandy's going to do is he's going to say, look, there's a better option than what Klein was doing. Um, not all the book of Revelation is a covenant or belongs in the covenant structure, but various parts of the book of Revelation do construct scenes like their lawsuit scenes, again, courtroom scenes. Revelation 4 and 5 is the most prominent of these. So he's going to say, you know, an, an approach like Chilton's a bit exaggerated. So I, I bring up Chilton because Again, he is in the Christian orbit. You know, we're going to have listeners who are familiar with Chilton, and they're going to think that covenant lawsuit backdrop to the book of Revelation is Chilton. It's not really the case. What, what Chilton was doing is, is something a little bit different. Um, and again, Bandy's going through a, a whole bunch of people. But, you know, again, I picked Chilton because he's, he's going to be familiar to a lot of people in the audience. So pluses and minuses, just like everything else. Again, one of the, one of the things he likes about Chilton is that uh, for instance, the insight, his insight that the four series of seven judgments in the book of Revelation are based on Leviticus 26 warrants serious consideration. Again, that's going to show up later in, in the book and in, in some of the specific things we see in the book of Revelation. So again, there, there are important things here that, that a writer like Chilton and, and those who follow him are going to be tracking on, but that is not what we're going to do today. That is not what we mean by the covenant lawsuit genre. It's, it's bigger than what Meredith Klein wrote. It's bigger than what Shilton wrote. And, and it's also different in, in some respects. So the observation, let's just take as our point of departure here, this, this four series of seven judgments based on Leviticus 26, that's going to factor into Bandy's own contribution that the sections of the book of Revelation, various sections are framed by, again, this prophetic courtroom, this prophetic drama sort of scene. If you think back to Leviticus 26 and passages like Deuteronomy 28 and 29, where God lays out, again, these, basically the stipulations for blessing, and then if, if those are violated, then you're, you're cursed. Those passages, Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28, 29, are often used in the Old Testament in other places as the basis for, for the prosecution. In other words, God is is upset at Israel's apostasy, and then the, a, a prophet will, will put Israel in a courtroom scene, and God begins to build a case against uh, his people, Israel. And, you know, in this, this is going to in part explain why, you know, the Assyrians are going to come and conquer you, or why the Babylonians are going to come and conquer you. So these, these, these cursings, you know, they come from these earlier chapters, these violations of, of the covenant. I mean, Leviticus 26 is Torah. Deuteronomy 28 and 29 is Torah, okay? It's part of the covenant, you know, God makes with Israel. These violations are going to become the basis for God's judgment. And articulating the case against Israel is going to be part of the covenant lawsuit genre. So all of that's legit. Again, what, where, where Bandy would say Chilton goes too far is to try to make like the whole book of Revelation somehow following these, these covenantal structures and whatnot. You know, it, it, again, it's just, it's an exaggeration of the case, but, but the case itself in, in parts of the book is, is, is legit. And Revelation 4 and 5 is a big place where this is very evident, plus it takes place in the divine courtroom. So it's a divine council scene. 
Now, you know, Bandy again, you know, summarizes all this and he, and he, he gets to part, the part of his dissertation where he gets into R. Dean Davis's dissertation, which is one of the three sources I, I mentioned at the beginning. So part of Davis's dissertation deals with the divine council specifically as a deliberative body. Again, think of a courtroom, sort of like God is judge. Okay, and the council is, is the jury, or at least they're participating jurors in concert with God, who in many cases, God is also the jury. He's the judge and the jury and the prosecutor in some of these scenes. And Bandy writes of Davis's study, again, here's how he summarizes it. He says, Davis's thematic analysis of Revelation 4 and 5 attempts to portray, one, a covenant context within a temple setting. Think of God's throne room here. Two, a heavenly court scene involving a divine council. And three, an investigative type judgment of the Lamb in corporate solidarity with his people. Davis isolates five themes evident in chapters four and five, which includes A, temple theology, B, ontological cosmic unity, C, judgment, D, covenant and royal theology, and E, trinitarian involvement in salvation. The subsequent chapters attempt to explicate these themes as they relate to the Old Testament and Revelation. Now, some of that language, especially investigative judgment, is going to sound like Seventh-day Adventist theological stuff. And, and that's correct, because Davis is an Adventist. <laughs> uh, and Andrews University, where he did, the, did this dissertation, is an Adventist school. Um, and, and, you know, Bandy's well aware of this. And so, you know, he, he's going he's gonna to push back on, on some of that kind of content. But the important thing about Davis's work for us and really for what Bandy's doing is, is again, bringing the divine council sort of front and center into this. And so he, he writes elsewhere about Davis. He says, a major corollary to Davis's analysis of the heavenly courtroom scene is the presence of the divine council. In chapter four, Davis reviews 1 Kings 22, Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1 through 11, and Daniel 7 as significant Old Testament passages for interpreting the role of the divine council in heavenly beings, in Revelation 4 and 5. After a summary of each passage, he provides an analysis of what those passages reveal about the divine council. Davis also discusses the terms, location, members, and decisions of the divine council in an integrative summary. He argues that in the covenant lawsuit, Yahweh functions as both the prosecutor and judge, whereas a member of the divine council functions, or in other words, like the son of man or somebody like that, Members of the Divine Council function as a witness, Job 1619, a vindicator, Job 1925, a mediator, Job 33, 23, and 24, an intercessor, Isaiah 53, 11, and 12, and Hebrews 725, and an advocate before God, Daniel 713, Daniel 727. In these Old Testament passages, the council convenes before divine actions are taken suggesting that its primary function is executive or judicial decision-making. The council passes judgment within the context of the covenant, and on that basis, a verdict is followed by subsequent actions. I'm gonna, I'll just stop there. Again, we, we've talked before, and I talked about this in Unseen Realm, about there are certainly some passages where you see divine council participation in the decision-making process of God. You know, and in other in other places, it's a little it's nuanced a different way that that the council carries out a decision made. In First Kings twenty two, again, this is a classic text. First Kings twenty two nineteen through twenty three. It's time for Ahab to die. God has already decreed, you know, that okay, that Ahab needs to go, and so, you know, the the, the council is called together, and God says, hey, you know, how are we going to do that? You know, let, let let's let let's hear you, let's hear what you propose. So He lets them participate. And then, you know, the spirits, you know, go back and forth and the spirit steps forward. So I got a great idea. I'll be a, a lying spirit in the mouth of all these prophets. And God says, yep, that'll work. You know, I know how I, I pretty well that, that he's going to be toast, you know, when, when, when you try that on him. So, you know, there's this participatory element. So I, I, I wanted to read that paragraph specifically, even though it's a summary, it doesn't get into the nuts and bolts. So that, again, th this audience knows that when you hear this kind of stuff about a divine council and participating in God's, you know, judgment and and working for God, and, and again, God, God allowing them, you know, again, some, some input, this kind of thing. It's not just crazy Mike, okay? It's not that Heiser guy. This is just mainstream scholarship, okay? This is Old Testament scholarship. I'm just letting you know it's there. And again, in Unseen Realm, it, it becomes part of Unseen Realm. This is what I do in, in Unseen Realm is, is try to make 
biblical scholarship about, you know, the flow of biblical theology, decipherable and digestible to, you know, normal people, people who aren't going to go out and get degrees, but they, they, they already know that the way scholars talk and think about the scriptures is a lot different than what you hear in church. Okay, so we're, we're filling in lots of gaps here, and I'm, I'm exposing you. My, my views on things are not idiosyncratic. This is why I, I, I clutter my books with resource references, footnotes, okay? I do that for a reason, because I want you to know this other work is out there. You just didn't know it was out there. Here's where to find it. Buy the book, get the journal article, whatever it is, and away you go. You know, I want to I want to sort of empower the audience to to do the research. So, I th- I, I wanted to include that passage, you know, about you know Dean's study here. Uh, you know, what 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 Dean does from that point on is he has like a mini commentary on Revelation four and five in his dissertation. You know, again from the Divine Council perspective. So, um. Let's just move on a little bit here. Davis, again, R. Dean Davis, again, is the one that that focuses on counsel a lot. And also the third dissertation source, Kensky's dissertation, they have chapters in their respective dissertations overviewing sort of how the heavenly court or the heavenly council works. You know, like like, um, some of, and again, some of it's speculative. Kensky, Kensky takes a, how can I describe her? She's a, I mean, Bandy's an evangelical. Davis is in the Adventist um, context. Kensky is Jewish, but I think her, her writing is a little bit more cynical too. But it, it's still really good stuff, you know, lot, lots of good data. Um, but but they, you know, every, every writer sort of has to, they go off of trajectories and, and, you know, speculate here and there about, you know, what, how the council would actually work or not. But, but Davis and Kensky both attempt to do this. And I'm going to, I'm going to give you a little sample of, of, of what Kensky says here and, and try to read between the lines a little bit, because I, I actually kind of like, you know, what, what she does in the beginning of her dissertation here. She says throughout the Hebrew Bible, there are images of God holding trial and acting in a judicial capacity. Sometimes these images appear in narrative presentations, such as the visions of Micaiah bar Imla, it's 1 Kings 22, Zechariah 3, and the prologue to Job, Job 1 and 2. At other points, as in Psalm 50, the framework is poetic, leaving the reader to fill out the narrative setting. Still other texts are legal in nature, and imagine God's courtroom not only as occurring in some heavenly realm, but also as intersecting with the human courtroom on the ground. All these texts bear witness to the flexibility of this scene for different rhetorical and religious purposes. Sometimes the courtroom imagery is found for purposes of consolation, comfort, and hope. At other points, the courtroom framework is used to provoke shame or regret and repentance. Often these reasons coincide as more than one is intended at any given moment. Then I'll skip a little bit. The the divine courtroom in the Hebrew Bible is not always visible to the naked eye. Often the texts which become most central to later interpreters, even later interpreters within the canon itself, are not prima facie instances of the divine courtroom. Only an understanding of the divine courtroom as a deeply ingrained feature of the religious imagination of ancient Israel can reveal the importance of these texts. And she gives an example. One such example occurs on Mount Sinai. Having displayed extraordinary boldness before God, advocating for Israel after the golden calf, Moses insists that God show him his ways so that he may know him. Exodus 33, 13. The request to know your ways, quote unquote, is nothing less than a desire to penetrate the workings of the divine mind and to understand the process of divine decision-making, to perceive how God functions. And she goes on and you know, talks about you know, God's response to Moses and whatnot. Again, she, I, I use the word, maybe she's a little bit cynical in places, because I, I think she, um, well, on the one, let me put it this way. I'll just kind of summarize my thought here. On one hand, it's true that God's decisions and actions can be perceived by the reader as being unjust 
or or a bit nasty. Okay, that, that's true on the surface, but but in the context of covenant violation, it, it's really hard again for me to say that God is being unjust because essentially they had fair warning here, you know. So you know she she riffs on that sometimes, uh, and I think a little bit too negatively. Again, she she drifts into into what she perceives as as some moral ambiguities about what you know God's decision making and so on and so forth. But uh, again, it, it's a it's kind of a I don't want to call it a secular reading. I mean, she, because she's she's Jewish, and, and um, I I can't make any other assumptions beyond that. But maybe she maybe she's filtering a little bit of this through the Jewish experience and whatnot. I don't know. It, it's it's a good dissertation. There's a lot of good material here, good data, and and. It's just it's wonderful that she's paying attention, you know, to this whole whole theme. But but if you read if you read all three of these, hers hers is going to feel a little bit different again because of the way she takes you know certain things about you know what God is doing or what or, or God's behavior, so to speak, uh, in in the courtroom, you know, stacking the deck against the you know the, the one under trial. Well, okay, you know, if, you know, if if God really knows the heart, well then. Is that is that the proper way to characterize God as stacking the deck? God either knows or he's or he doesn't, and his 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 knowledge of of the person or the people is not going to be fallible. So anyway, I I just thought I'd throw that in in case you know we have people you know go out and and, and read either hers or all three of them. This one's going to feel a little bit different, but but uh, it it's pretty thorough you know in terms of the passages that pertain and and in what I just read there you know she says look if if you know the the court setting. If you know how ingrained this was in the religious and cultural understanding of people in ancient Israel, you're going to read other passages where where the, the a courtroom setting is not spelled out, and you'll just sense that that's what's going on. Um, so she, you know, her her dissertation I think is 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 pretty thorough and and well worth you know having you know as a resource. You know, she has sections on God as judge, handing down decisions. She gets into covenants there. Uh, for instance, this is this is unique to her. You're not going to find this in the other two. She has commentary about the use of divination and mediators like the Orium and the Thummim and the high priest, you know, what, how, how they function in God's decision-making, you know, capacities. She talks about there's, there's a hope of, of individuals in certain passages that are on trial, whether it's the Israelites or some specific person, that they hope that God will not be impartial. They, they don't want God to be impartial. They want him to favor Israel versus the nations, for example. So, you know, she'll say, well, is that really fair? Well, you know, it, yeah, it is, it is fair. <laughs> Again, based upon all the, all the history that, that's, you know, gone, you know, before this, um, you know, she'll, she, she has a lot of these little rabbit trails that are just kind of interesting. Uh, she has a section on how God is to be approached. Uh, and, and here she gets into Abraham and Moses about how they negotiate with God for uh, in, in regard to a decision. Again, she sees what, in these scenes. Let's just use those as an example. Abraham and Moses. She sees not only what's happening on the ground. Okay, as this is you know God's divine decision making. You know, then Moses and, and Abraham. You know, they're allowed to to dicker with God and negotiate and whatnot. But she will she will say by analogy this this also happens in the divine council or you actually have here because you also have two other witnesses these two angels okay that in in the scene with Abraham anyway and you and you could argue by extension the one with Moses whether it's you know it's it's not just the burning bush it's it's the whole scene at Sinai where the law is given you know, by the hand of angels I mean there are other witnesses here she, she's saying. You know, when, when when Moses has these conversations with God and when Abraham has these conversations with God, they're actually part of the courtroom scene. They're actually part of the council decision, looping humans in. Again, that, that's unique to her dissertation. So this is why I say it's pretty thorough. It's very interesting. But again, it's, it's going to be different than the other two. So anyway, on, on page 37, she gets into the what what this is Hebrew terminology, the reeve, that's R-I-B, but you'd pronounce it reeve like it's R-I-V. The reeve pattern. Reeve is a, is the word for dispute or lawsuit or quarrel or any one of those. This is the covenant lawsuit idea, the reeve pattern, the reeve genre. And she writes this, one of the most important ways in which the divine courtroom appears in the Hebrew Bible is through its invocation of the so-called prophetic lawsuit or reeve pattern form of prophetic speech. Throughout the prophetic literature, the prophets indict the people of Israel for various crimes against God, all of which ultimately lead up to the breach of covenant. 
For the prophets, this justifies God's intention to punish the people for their misdeeds. This form of prophetic address, therefore, is an explanation of why God's actions are just. The prophets use the legal language as a means of expressing God's formal complaints and rights as a litigant, an injured party, and show through the mechanisms of human justice how God's actions are themselves functions of divine justice, even though on the surface they may not seem so. Now she uses as a template example Micah 6, 1 through 8. Now I'm not gonna I'm not gonna read it because I'm just gonna give you the, the sort of the bullet points here. You'll get some translation here. I'm not sure this is Kensky's own translation or if she's using it, maybe the JPS Torah translation. I don't know. But she's gonna go through Micah 6 8 where Micah indicts the southern kingdom of Judah for social injustice and ethical improprieties. Now, this isn't a divine council scene, but this gives you the elements of, of a, a typical courtroom scene where God is putting Israel on trial, in this case, putting, putting the southern kingdom, Judah, on trial, and sort of how these scenes function. So this is pages 37 and 38 in her dissertation. Hear what Yahweh is saying. Arise, contend with the mountains. Now, the word contend there is reeve. Okay, so it's, it's a legal term. So, the, so when you see that as, as an Israelite, a Hebrew reader, you know, okay, we, we're, 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 this is a lawsuit. This is lawsuit terminology. God's going to bring a case here. Arise, contend with the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Hear mountains, the case, reeve, of Yahweh and everlasting foundations of the earth. For Yahweh has a case against his people. He has a reeve, there it is again, against his people, and he will reprove his people. My people, what have I done to you, and with what have I wearied you? Answer me, for I brought you out from the land of Egypt, from the house of slavery I redeemed you. And I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. My people, remember what Balak, the king of Moab, devised, and what Balaam, son of Beor, answered him, from Shittim to Gilgal, in order to know the justices of Yahweh. How shall I come before Yahweh, bow down before the God of heights? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings? This is the prophet's voice now. Or shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with year-old calves? Will Yahweh be pleased with thousands of rams, with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgressions, the fruit of my belly for the sin of my soul? He has told you, man, what is good, and what does Yahweh seek from you but to do justice, to love chesed, and humbly walk with your God. So we have a case, you know, there, there's charges given by Yahweh against the people. Like, I haven't done bad things to you, and, you know, I've done all these good things to you. And, it, and it, again, in the context, Micah 6, we have all these abuses happening in Judah. And so it's like, you know, what does God really want? You know, what what, what does God consider just? I mean, what, what's he really after here? You know, does he want you to bring sacrifices and bow down with calves and your firstborn and rams? And, you know, no, no, what he wants, he, he's told you what to do, what is good. You know, to do justice, to love chesed, you know, this, this loving loyalty idea and to walk humbly with your God. So Micah 6, 1 through 8 lays out this case against the people. It's done with legal language. So the language used in here in the Israelite context, this was courtroom, you know, jargon. Okay. And you, you've seen court cases on TV or, you know, you know, whether it's, it's, it's fictional portrayals or something else, you know, that, that how things get discussed in, in a court of law are different than just a normal conversation. Well, when you hit again, the terminology used here, the reader will instantly know there are, Judah's on trial. And, and the point here is that this language and the, and the trappings of the scene, you know, the, the prosecutorial stance, you know, the witnesses called, you know, to bear witness against the, the, whoever's the defendant for their crimes and all this stuff. Sometimes these sorts of settings occur specifically in, you know, divine council scenes where God is enthroned in his, you know, heavenly temple, his house. Okay. This is where the divine council meets, all that stuff. So these elements, again, play out in a lot of these scenes where God is, you know, prosecutor and judge, in some cases even jury, divine council members play different roles. And I'm going to go back to Davis here. Davis, you know, again, summarizes some of this. He says, 
An examination of the activities of the members of the, of the Divine Council reveals that they fulfill several different functions, including some specific roles. They surround the head of the council as attendants, 1 Kings 22, 19, Ezekiel 1, 12 through 14, Daniel 7, 10. Again, Daniel 7 is a big deal here. And I want you to hold on to, on to that from this point forward because Daniel 7 is going to be the backdrop, specifically the passage that John uses when he writes Revelation 4 and 5. Daniel 7 is a divine council scene. Daniel 7, 9, 10, really 9 through 13. That's why Revelation 4 and 5 is very clearly a divine council courtroom scene. All right? Back to Dean. It says, uh, again, these the council members support the divine throne for the, the, the head of the council. And he gives various references. I'm not just going to list out all the references here. Um, they praise and adore the head of the council. Job 38 is a classic. Psalm 29, 1 through 2. Psalm 89, 5 through 6. Again, these are this is all divine council stuff. Isaiah 6, 3. They participate in the council proceedings, 1 Kings 22, 20. They give counsel, Isaiah 44, 26. They're there to promote justice among the peoples, Psalm 82. That's what they're supposed to be doing. And serve as guardians or watchers, Daniel 4. And several references in there. After the council decision has been made and announced, they serve as messengers of the decision. Exodus 14, 19, Numbers 22, 31, 1 Kings 22, 21 through 22, Isaiah 6, 8 through 9. Individually, Gabriel appears to be a specially named messenger in some of these contexts. Daniel 8, 16, for instance. A special role appears to be taken by one who is an intercessor, witness, or advocate for the faithful on earth before the head of the council. He brings up Psalm 89 here, which we've talked before about talked about before on the podcast. In Daniel 7, 13 and 14, the one like a son of man appears to serve as the witness or intercessor on behalf of the saints, the holy ones of the Most High, and the people of the saints of the Most High. Daniel 7, 25 through 27. And from that point on, he Dean quotes Mullen's classic study of the Divine Council. Again, this is from Mullen's book page 228. It's very hard to find this, but you know you can get it. You can still find it in PDF here and there. Uh, Theodore Mullen uh, writes, in Hebrew thought, Yahweh functions as both prosecutor and judge when a negative judgment is rendered in the fr- infrequent Old Testament divine reeve lawsuit context. Again, Mullen's all, you know, over, all over the same set of information. I'm not going to you know, read it because it's repetitious. And Davis you know, goes through Mullen's work, and then he observes that in all major council scenes, all the big ones, the ones you, that are most familiar, 1 Kings 22, Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1 through 11, and Daniel 7. All of them have the head of the council seated on a throne. God, the king judge, is attended to by various members of the heavenly host. And sometimes those members, at least some of them, are also seated. Daniel 7, the thrones were placed, plural. Isaiah and Ezekiel situate the throne inside the temple. So there's a temple setting implied for these judgment scenes. The temple, of course, is where God abides and the place from which he rules. So that makes sense. There is evidence, Daniel 4, Daniel 7, 1 Kings 22, of participation in decision-making and counsel, so on and so forth. Now, what Bandy's going to do, you know, again, he goes through, you know, Dean's work and some of this other stuff and so on and so forth. What Bandy's going to do is say, okay, if you have all that in your head, if you have all that in your head and you look at Revelation 4 and 5, you're going to notice some things right away. He summarizes the parallels, and so I'm going to I'm going to use his summary to sort of you know head towards setting up the next episode here for us. He writes on page this is pages 44 and 45 again. If you go get his dissertation, he says first God is described as the head of the divine council in terms do- drawn directly from the Old Testament. You look at how God is described in Revelation 4 and 5. It's going to come out of the Old Testament and these scenes. Second. The 24 elders function in a capacity similar to the divine council in the Old Testament. And he, he quotes, he actually cites here Isaiah 24, 23, Yahweh, you know, among his elders. In Israel, elders traditionally served as community leaders or royal officials who participated in council sessions and sat as judges. Third, Davis contends that other beings like the seven spirits of God, the four living creatures, John, a strong angel, the lamb, the myriad of angels, you know, all these characters. Even every creature in the cosmos could all be classified as members of the divine council in these scenes. Fourth, the issue before the council is the worthiness of the lamb to open the sealed scroll. 
The final evidence that Davis cites is that of the judicial nature of the scroll itself. He states that the seals were used to provide legal validity to the document that Davis maintains as the Lamb's Book of Life. Now, that's Davis's interpretation of the scroll. But again, you, you get this, this courtroom trapping sort of feel, you know, this context. A da- you know, Bandy, again, he's very positive of what Davis is writing. You know, he, t- he tweaks it here and there because he, what he's going to do in his own work is, is sort of improve the, the counsel elements here. The fourth chapter of Bandy's dissertation is entitled An Exegetical Survey of the Prophetic Lawsuit in the Second Vision of Revelation. It's Revelation 4, 1 through 16, 21. So he takes it all the way to chapter 16, chapters 4 through 16. We're only focused here, at least at this point, on Revelation 4 and 5. So I want to I get into, again, some of the things in 4 and 5 here just to set up. But I, I can't exclude what Bandy writes about the first three chapters. We've already been through the first three chapters, and, we've, and we've, we've done this drill down thing. But now that we're at chapters four and five, there's stuff in Revelation one through three that contributes to or, or is in some way involved with this covenant lawsuit, divine counsel, courtroom thing that, that you're going to get hit in the face with you know, when, you, when you get out of chapter three and into chapter four. So, so Bandy summarizes it this way. He says, the letters to the seven churches constitute lawsuit speeches, whereby Jesus conducts a forensic examination of his covenant people. Let me just think about the content of Revelation 1 through 3, these letters to the churches, okay? Back to Bandy. He says, the form of the letters generally distinguishes them as prophetic oracles, similar to the Old Testament prophets, and more specifically, as covenant lawsuit speeches. As such, the book of Revelation follows the pattern of the Old Testament prophetic lawsuit that begins with the people of God. The judgments and promises announced for the churches in the seven letters remain contingent upon what they do in response to these oracles. In this sense, the remaining vision, especially the interludes, relates to how the churches respond. In other words, whether they faithfully endure as witnesses during the heightened state of persecution. Once the Lord deals with his people, he turns his attention to the surrounding nations with oracles of judgment. This pattern is established by the Song of Moses in Deuteronomy 32. There's Deuteronomy 32 again. Once the covenant people repent and obey, Yahweh promises to exact vengeance on Israel's pagan enemies. That, that's, that's actually a reference to Deuteronomy 32.43. You know, if you read through Deuteronomy 32, I'm just going to break in here. You know, we get verses 8 and 9, which this audience knows well, the disinheritance of the nations, and Yahweh takes Israel as his own, okay? But then you keep reading all, all the way up to like verse 17, you know, when, when they worship the Shadim, you know, quote-unquote demons, you know, they worship, you know, gods that they had not known. Deuteronomy 32 shifts from the Babel event to an indictment of Israel for apostasy, as you keep reading. And what Bandy's saying is, look, this notion of, like in, in, the, in the book of Revelation, you get these oracles, these letters to the churches, where the people of God are being evaluated and judged, and in some cases commended, okay? And that's going to carry all the way through the rest of the book of Revelation. You know, how, how do God's people respond to what happens in the first three chapters, these letters? You know, do they hold fast under persecution? Do they refuse, again, to, to be disloyal you know, to Yahweh? I mean, all these, these different sort of themes. And then once God's people get dealt with, then all of a sudden the attention in the book of Revelation shifts to the judgment of the nations. And of course, at the end, the nations are going to be, God is going to, you know, there's, there's going to be healing of the nations ultimately. Okay, so if you know the, the whole flow here. And, and if you go to Deuteronomy 32 again, it begins, you know, with, here's, here's, Here's the way the situation was with Israel, and then Israel apostatized, and then you know God deals with Israel, and then eventually you get to, to verse 43 in Deuteronomy 32, where God is taking revenge against the, the gods, okay, gods of the nations, and so on and so forth. So Bandy's saying, you know, this is the pattern of Deuteronomy 32. It just, you know, this is the lawsuit of Deuteronomy 32, and, and it's played out, it, it's it's tracked on in the book of Revelation. So back to Bandy, he says, the book of Revelation, likewise sounds a note, similar note of judgment pertaining to the churches, but then the remaining contents of the vision pertains to the judgment of the nations. Significantly, the judgment of the nations is closely tied 
to the theme of revenge, vengeance for their treatment of the saints, which is, again, Deuteronomy 32, 43. So I would summarize it this way. In essence, Revelation 1 through 3 is both a lawsuit dealing with the followers of Jesus. You know, they, they get warnings and in some cases indictment. You know, and, and again, they get commended as well. It, it's, a, it's a lawsuit, kind of a, a courtroom drama, a courtroom evaluation of the followers of Jesus. But at the same time, it's also building a case against the nations. Because some of the churches that are the recipients of the letters, have been, they, they have been faithful. They have endured under persecution, and they're, they're suffering at the hands of the nations. So it's both evaluative, and, and all of that testimony is going to be used later to indict the nations. Now, Beale and Carson, if you think, ah, oh, yeah, I don't know, that's, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the Revelation 4 and 5 and all this divine counsel stuff. Okay, let's go to some familiar evangelical voices here, you know, other than me. Beale and Carson's commentary on the Old Testament used in the New Testament lays this out in 14 steps. <laughs> they lay it out. They lay out the courtroom setting of Revelation 4 and 5 really nicely. Basically, they move from the divine council courtroom scene in Daniel 7 over to Revelation 4 and 5. So here's what they write. An overview of the two chapters together in Revelation 4 and 5 reveals that they exhibit a unified structure that corresponds to the structure of Daniel 7. You know, more, it corresponds more to the structure of Daniel 7 than any other vision of the Old Testament. If we begin with Daniel 7, 9 through 28, and observe the elements, you know, in that passage, and the order of their presentation in that passage, if we, if we look at all that and, and say, well, you know, what about Daniel 7, 9 through 28? is in common with Revelation 45. This is their words. A striking resemblance is discernible. I'm I'm just going to go through the list. One, introductory vision phraseology. Daniel 7, you align Daniel 7, uh, verse 9, and then they loop in verse 2 and verses 6 and 7 with Revelation 4.1. It's going to look a lot alike. Setting of the thrones, or thrones in heaven, Daniel 7, 9a, Revelation 4.2a, and 4.4a. God sitting on a throne, Daniel 7, 9b, Revelation 4, 2b. Description of God's appearance on the throne. John even borrows the description. You have Daniel 7, 9c and Revelation 4, 3a. Fire before the throne, Daniel 7, 9 and 10, Revelation 4, 5. Heavenly servants surrounding the throne, Daniel 7, 10b, Revelation 4, 4b, so on and so forth. I mean, maybe maybe it's a little too much detail, but 14. Specific parallels between Daniel 7. You know, when we do the transcript, we'll just include you know, the rest of them. But there are 14 specific parallels between Daniel 7 and Revelation 4 and 5, and they're in the same order. It's completely obvious A, that Daniel 7 is a divine council scene, and B, John is, you know, riffing off of it in Revelation 4 and 5. He could not be any more explicit and detailed, and thorough in the alignment. And Daniel 7, again, is a courtroom scene. It is part of this covenant lawsuit thing going on. In, the, in Daniel 7's case, of course, the, 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 the four beasts, the nations are going to be judged. That they're, they're the ones, you know, sitting un, under the, you know, under indictment, okay, in, in that scene. Here, again, you're going to have... You know, well, Daniel 7 also loops in the people of God, too. But here you're going to have in, uh, I'll just pull out number 10 here, Beyond Carson. There's a reference to the kingdom, which includes all peoples, nations, and tongues. It's not just Israel. Okay, so you, again, you, you, you have, it's this full-orbed thing. You know, the, 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 the kingdom of, uh, that is, is talked about in Daniel 7 isn't just the kingdom of Israel. Okay, the Son of Man is, is, is Lord of the nations. And over in Revelation 4 or 5, the nations are going to be in view too. You're going to have both believers. Are they enduring? Are they holding up? You know, are, are, they, are they sustaining their belief, their faith? And what about the nations? You know, we are nearing, we are approaching. We're, we're really in the, in the process of the, of the nations now coming under judgment. So it, you, you get the whole mix. 
it's very deliberate tracking between Revelation 4, 5 and Daniel 7. Um, you know, just on and on and on it goes. So I, I think that's actually a, a good place to stop. And it, it's a good setup for part two, our next episode, because we, we can just conclude it this way. There is a solid consensus of scholarship and there is an indisputable relationship between Revelation 4, 5 and Daniel 7. And Daniel 7 is firmly part of what we would call the covenant lawsuit genre in the Old Testament, this this divine, and even more specifically, a divine council lawsuit scenes. Daniel 7 is right smack dab in the middle of that. It is a classic example. And Revelation 4 and 5 uses it 14 points, even in order. It's unmistakable. So there's a solid consensus of scholarship and data here that utilize all of this stuff. And this is the Old Testament context for the larger picture of Revelation 4 and 5. And with that as a backdrop, when we return in the next episode, we're going to drill down. We're going to start to drill down. I, I may be able to cover Revelation 4 and in one more episode. We'll see. You know, when, once I get, get my head into the, into the material, you know, maybe we'd have a part three. I don't know yet. But we're going to be reading Revelation 4 against the backdrop of, of a divine council courtroom. Okay. And then within that, John is going to be bringing other Old Testament data in to articulate specific things, specific points, and illustrate specific things and specific points. So John is, has set the table. His readers know, if they know Daniel 7, which is a really fundamentally important passage, okay, if they know Daniel 7, they know just what the scene is in Revelation 4 and 5. And they're going to be reading with John this court proceeding. And as John goes through the, you know, the courtroom drama, he's going to be drawing in other things to make the case and explain what's going on or what's going, you know, the things that are, the things that are going to happen and so on and so forth. So that's, I think, a good place to stop and set up uh, the next episode. So lots of Old Testament stuff going on here, both at the macro level and then, as we'll see next time, in very specific ways. It's amazing how much Old Testament is in Revelation. So, uh, yeah, you know, there's some other books out there, people. I don't have any off the top of my head as far as uh, Old Testament and Revelation. Yeah, our, our first episode, I think the introductory episode, I referenced three or four of these. Again, the, the the ones there's one by Beale, there's one by Stephen uh, Moise. I don't I, I I don't even know if I'm pronouncing his name correctly. It's M O Y I S E. Those those are two sort of surveys, and then Beale and, and Carson's commentary is specifically aimed at Old Testament repurposing in the New Testament. Of course, you know, they go through the whole Book of Revelation there too. But if they go back to the introductory episode, you know, people can get these titles and you look at the transcripts too. But Again, they're, they're academic works, but, you know, I would, I would think a lot of the people in our audience, most of our audience, you know, could, could handle a lot of that content. Well, we'll be looking for two next week. And with that, Mike, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 367, Revelation for part two. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike. How are you? Pretty good. It's warm here. We have we have uh, weather this weekend now and forecast for the 80s. So it might be time to have the pugs take a dip in the pool. Supervised, of course. Sure, sure. Have you taken a dip yet in the pool? No, but I, I would take them in. I would do that.
Yeah. Well, yeah, you're, I would you're, do that just, just for the experience. You sure you take pictures and post it. So the, we all the can. pug, yeah, the pug pool party experience. We're all <laughs> wanting to see that, uh, that looks like. So please, if you don't, yeah, ho- hopefully it doesn't involve our, you know, resuscitation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what's the hottest it gets there in Jacksonville. Do you know? And it's kind of humid. Oh, last too, summer, right? you know. Yeah, it, it's real humid. It, 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 you know, it got into the 90s, you know, mid 90s with with high humidity. I mean, you you'll get higher temperatures like in the southwest or something, but you don't have the humidity there. Yeah, that's what makes it hard. You know, just the, it's so sticky. You know, you you go out and you walk around the house and you know then it looks like you took a shower and you probably need to take a shower. But, that's what oh, yeah. it is. I lived in Savannah, Georgia for a year and uh it was hundred percent humidity. I'd walk out and boom, I'd just be wet. Mm-hmm. It was miserable. Yeah. Yeah. It was horrible. But my hair looked good. <laughs> <laughs> Your hair looked good. But my hair oh, looked well. good, yeah. All that humidity did wonders for my hair. What did it curl up? I have no idea, Mike. I can't remember. It was a long time ago. So that but... so that was not that was not high school, you know, that that like no. you weren't doing like football practice and no, that, you no. know. Because oh, I remember no. doing that in high school. Oh, so you talk, I did it in Texas where it was 120 degrees doing football practice. Yeah. And uh I mean that was worse. Ridiculous. Yeah, that's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah, I'm getting flashbacks. We need to move on because I'm starting to <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> have physical right. tumors here. No. But hey. We're doing part two, and uh, we're going to have three parts of Revelation 4. We've got lots to yeah, talk well, about here. Hopefully it won't be four parts. You know, it'll, We'll try to get it in a third next time. But, yeah, yeah, here we are. You know, it's just There's just so much going on related to the Old Testament you know, in these chapters. So I don't, I don't want to just arbitrarily skip something just for the sake of you know, not doing a separate part. So here we are. But we might as well just jump in here. We should probably say something about part one. You know, if, if somebody's just jumping in here, yeah, you probably need to go listen to part one uh, before you hit this one. Although, you know, maybe I can summarize things. You know, last time we closed with uh, some material from Alan Bandy. Basically, the, the focus of part one was how Revelation 4 and 5 repurposes something called the covenant lawsuit genre of the Old Testament, which is a fancy way of saying you have these scenes in the Old Testament that are courtroom scenes. And you have you know certain courtroom scenes that just involve people. That's actually the minority, though. Usually it's God uh, sort of in a, in a courtroom setting or with courtroom language. And there's a technical term for this, the reeve. You know, the, that, that means it's a Hebrew term for lawsuit or quarrel or contention or something like that, debate. You'd have God bringing a reeve, a lawsuit against his people for violating the covenant. So there's a bunch of these where, you know, God is the judge and the jury and the prosecutor, you know, either all those parts or or, or the majority of them. And in some of those, that courtroom is set with the divine counsel. You know, it, it's it's a heavenly courtroom. You have witnesses there, members of the heavenly host that are part of the proceedings. So this is the backdrop to Revelation 4 and 5. You know, Bandy, I'll, I'll just take a little slice of what we, we closed with with him. He says, The letters to the seven churches constitute lawsuit speeches, whereby Jesus conducts a forensic examination of his covenant people. So even in the first three chapters, you have this, this court of, sort of lawsuit or courtroom kind of challenge where there's an indictment being issued, and, and, and do the, the, the people— that are being spoken to, do they do well? Are they vindicated or do they have something you know, to, to change or to fix here? Bandy says, the form of the letters generally distinguishes them as prophetic oracles similar to the Old Testament prophets. So again, these letters themselves pattern themselves after things that you'll find in the prophets. And then he goes on and he, and he says, the book of Revelation generally you know, follows the pattern of the Old Testament prophetic lawsuit that begins with the people of God. You have judgments and promises announced for the churches in the seven letters, and they remain contingent upon what they do in response to those oracles. So, he, you know, he, he descri- describes this a little bit, and he, but he makes the point toward the end of this quotation that we ended part one with, that the first three chapters, you have this, 
this dialogue between you know Jesus, the one you know telling John to write, you know the exalted, you know ancient of days, son of man figure. Okay, and it, it sounds like it, that's only that's the only thing happening in the dialogue. But later, you know, Bandy points out that the proceedings here and 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 the content of some of these things, you know, is going to be transferred over or carry over into an indictment of the nations. Okay, not not you know the. It, God's people per se, but their enemies as well. And so that's, you know, where Revelation is going to be heading. So Bandy says, look, you know, that this covenant lawsuit thing begins with the letters to the churches, and it's going to be found throughout the book. But Revelation 4 and 5 uh, is is really sort of the big one. And, and I mentioned at the end of the last uh, episode, Beale and Carson. Uh, it was actually Beale and, and uh, I think McDonough the ones who actually wrote this part of that Old Testament in the New Testament commentary that's edited by Beale and Carson. They look at, at Daniel 7, which is a very you know, famous and indisputable divine council, divine courtroom scene. And there are 14 points, that 14 features of Daniel 7 that occur in Revelation 4 and 5 in the same order. So it's very clear that John is tracking on Daniel 7. Uh, and And I'm going to use that as a segue because uh, I, I didn't quote this in the uh, in, in the first episode, but uh, one of the other sources that we I introduced to the audience in the in the introductory episode to this series, which is the use of the Old Testament revelation uh, by Steve. And I, again, I always wonder if I pronounce his name correctly. Moise. That's M O Y I S E. And his book is the Old Testament in the Book of Revelation. It's an edited volume. He actually you know, references Daniel 7 too. And he has a, he has a chart in his book, actually a series of charts where he, he'll map over parts of Daniel 7 over to Revelation 4. So you, I'm just going to give a few examples here in the first 10 verses of Revelation 4. Uh, what, what parts of Daniel 7 show up? Well, in Revelation 4, 2a, in the first part of the verse, that references a throne in heaven, which is Daniel 7, 9a. 4.2b references God on the throne. That's 7.9b. And Revelation 4.3a, the first part of 4.3, you have an appearance of, of the deity, appearance of God. It's also Daniel 7.9. Again, third part of that, that verse. Revelation 4.5, you have fire before the, the throne. And again, that's in Daniel 7, 9, and 10. You have throne attendants. Again, here you get the heavenly host language in Revelation 4.4b 4, and then 6 through 10. Again, that's Daniel 7, second part of that verse. So you could track all the way through Revelation 4 and 5 and find these elements from Daniel 7. It's very easy. Now, for what we're going to do in this part, we need to add some things because we're going to go in a few different directions here. But but again, tied back into these, these scenes, these you know the divine council courtroom scenes, to these items in Daniel 7, it could be added when you get into Revelation 4. Ezekiel 1, cherubim imagery, and Isaiah 6, seraphim imagery. You get fire again, again, which you, you could go to Isaiah 6 and see that. You go to Ezekiel 1 and see that. Okay, what will become evident is that John is effectively casting the throne room scene in Revelation 4 and 5 with elements from Daniel 7 and Ezekiel 1 and Isaiah 6, three divine council scenes. And each one of those scenes reinforces, again, the idea of God's sovereign rule and his oversight. You know, he is ultimately the judge of all things. And that's going to be a theme that will emerge in Revelation 4 pretty quickly. But I'm going to read, uh, for the sake of our, our episode here, I'm going to read a few verses from Revelation 4 so that you can sort of mentally go back and catch some of these images. Again, in, the, in these three major passages, Daniel 7, Ezekiel 1, Isaiah 6, there's going to be others. But those are those are the three main ones, and they're all divine council scenes. So why don't I just I'll just start in verse one here again, and we'll read maybe, oh maybe that maybe through through verse ten again. Some of these things we we've, we've talked about uh, a little bit before. You're going to hear references to white garments and crowns, and we we had those in earlier chapters of Revelation and earlier episodes. But a lot of new stuff here. So John writes, after this I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice, which I heard speaking to me like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had the appearance of jasper and carnelian, and around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. 
around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder, and before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature like a lion, the second living creature like an ox, the third living creature with the face of a man, and the fourth living creature like an eagle in flight. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings, are full of eyes all around and within. And day and night they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne, saying, Worthy are you, O Lord and God, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. So that, that's actually the entirety of chapter 4. We won't go into chapter 5, but you can see right away you know, how parts of Ezekiel 1, parts of Isaiah 6. Of course, we've already tracked, you know, with the Daniel 7 thing in the last episode a little bit here. Um, you have an amalgamation of very obvious and noteworthy divine throne room, divine council scenes, you know, God with his, his attendants and so on and so forth. Of course, Daniel 7 is really capturing a courtroom imagery because it uses, you know, it has references to multiple thrones being there. The court sat and the books were opened again, Daniel 7. So it, it, the context for this is pretty clear. And these all are going to provide some input into, you know, how we parse some of the elements here in chapter four. So let, let's just start in verse one. We'll work our way through as to, you know, what's going on here. Again, it's not only these three passages, but there's going to be some others here, but these are the primary ones. Now, as we do this, just think about, and for, for people in this audience who are familiar with Unseen Realm, you know, my book, I mean, you're, you're, a, a lot of this you've already probably mentally looped in because, you know, heavenly courtroom, heavenly throne room, well, those aren't really separable from where God, you know, lives, you know, his house, uh, you know, the, these, these sorts of images, because they they all tend to, to overlap in Old Testament thought. And if, if you can sort of, you know, remember that point, then you, you could ask yourself, well, where else does God live? You know, in the Old Testament, well, he lives in mountains and gardens and, you know, cosmic mountain is, is a big theme uh, in Unseen Realm. We're, we're going we're gonna to draw on all of that here. So Revelation 4.1, the first voice, which I had heard speaking to me like a trumpet. Let me just stop right there. I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a rabbit trail, and I'm going to I'm, I'm going to do a little bit of end times systems here, just a spasm, just a note. It does not say the verse does not say that a trumpet sounded. It's not what it says. A voice. He hears a voice speaking to him, and the voice sounds like a trumpet. Okay, it's not a trumpet. It's a voice. So we must be talking about something like volume here, something really loud. That's the point. And this has an Old Testament, you know, precedent, which we'll get to in a moment. You know, the text clearly has John hearing a voice that came to him like a trumpet. It has some point of similarity to a trumpet. It's not a trumpet, just some point of similarity. So the verse actually provides no connection to presumed rapture passages. I mean, other passages in the New Testament that People are either going to interpret as a rapture or second coming or you know, something else. It doesn't really have a specific connection when, when it's just a trumpet because this is a voice. Now, you know, another sidebar. Those who hold to a pre-trib rapture add this thought to Revelation 4, uh, verse 1. They say, well, this must be the, tra the, the rapture, again, because they're, one, one, on one hand they're thinking trumpet, but they're going to add this. This must be the rapture because the church, they argue, is absent from the rest of the book. In other words, what they mean by that is that the word translated church, ecclesia, does not appear in the rest of the book of Revelation. That's actually a little bit of careless thinking. While, yeah, ecclesia does not occur the rest of the way, 
guess what does occur? The term holy ones, hagioi. It, it gets translated saints in the New Testament. It, that occurs 13 times. And that is a frequent designation of the church elsewhere in the New Testament, like, like Paul's letters. So it, it, it's really a, a misguided thought to say, well, after Revelation 4, 1, with this trumpet, the church is gone, so this must indicate the rapture, the church is taken off the earth. Well, no. The fact that ecclesia doesn't occur doesn't mean anything, because hagioi, holy ones, saints, occurs 13 times. So that's not a good argument for that. I mean, if you're going to be, if you're going to adopt a pre-trip rapture position, you need to come, you know, rely on, on something else other than this, because that's really a terrible argument. It's, it's something explicitly contradicted by the text later on. Lastly, I would say this is the same voice trumpet language we find in Revelation 1.10. Let's go back to Revelation 1.10. Again, just a suggestion here. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet. It's the same language that we just read in Revelation 4. I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Keep reading. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw, here you, here you get the seven golden lampstands. In the midst of the lampstand, one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe. Then you get the Ancient of Days image. I mean, this, this is the, 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 the deity Christ figure. That, that's whose voice this is. So if you, you know, if you go, to 110 when you're in 41 and think about there you know what you know, think about well what, what's the possible relationship here you know back in 110 you have the same thing we don't have a rapture there so why would we have a rapture in 41 and of course the argument is going to be circular here well we, we don't have a rapture in 110 because the, the churches are being addressed there's still the church on earth and again, the assumption being the church is off earth after chapter 4, verse 1, which is not true because holy ones again appears 13 times later on. So again, I, I wanted to get that spasm out because you do have an Old Testament image here, but it, it has no relationship. I mean, the, the point of the image does nothing to prop up a specific point of, of a specific system of end times thinking. Again, that, that's not the direction it goes. So before getting into you know where it where it does come from the Old Testament, I think we needed to say something there. So let's get away from the eschatological systems and go to the text. I think that's a good idea. That's what we try to do here. So on in his Revelation commentary writes of the trumpet metaphor, and he's going to loop in you know some things here, and, and and you'll you'll see what we're angling for. He says that a number of different metaphors are used in Revelation to capture the loudness of the voices heard by John. The sound of these voices is compared to the blast of a trumpet, as here. It's also compared to the sound of thunder, to the sound of roaring water. Sound of a trumpet or shofar was part of the Sinai theophany, according to Exodus 19:16 and Exodus 20:18. Again, what's that? The con what's happening in Exodus 19 and 20? It's the encounter with God on Mount Sinai after the Exodus, when they're going to receive the law, and and of course, you know, enter into the covenant with God. So back to on, he says, the motif of the sound of the trumpet continued to be used in theophanic contexts, you know, theophanies. You'd, you'd often get this language when there's a theophany in, in, in view or in, in the context. Let me give some examples. Isaiah 18.3, Joel 2.1, Zechariah 9.14, for instance. He said, you also see it used in the Israelite cult, that is, during certain rituals or certain festival events. 2 Samuel 6.15, Isaiah 27.13, Joel 2.15, and so on. The use of the shofar in the cultic settings could therefore be considered an imitation of the voice of Yahweh. Now, I think that's an interesting point. Let me just stop there for a moment. Why would they use trumpets you know, at, at, at certain rituals associated with the temple or the gathering of the people? Because that was designed to make people think of the voice of God at Sinai that sounded like a trumpet in, in terms of its volumes. That, that was the way they imitated it or mimicked it. Again, to, to call to their minds a recollection of, hey, we're Israel. And, and hey, God entered into covenant with us. And hey, you know, there's this thing, the law that we should be following. 
again, it was all designed to, to take the people back, you know, to sort of set uh, the scene or remind them of the original, you know, context for this stuff, which was, you know, their, you know, God making them anew and, and, and entering into this covenants at Sinai. So again, I thought that was kind of interesting. He adds a point here. He says the voice of Athena in, in Greco-Roman uh, liter- religious texts is compared to a trumpet in the introductory theophanic scene in Sophocles, his, his writings, Ajax, number 17. And thunder is called the trumpet of Zeus you know, in another text. So it, you, you, you probably de- most definitely have a hearkening back to Sinai you know, with this trumpet. In other words, the, the point is not that, that the voice in Revelation 4 is calling people back into the old covenant. This is Jesus. Okay, this is the Son of Man, the risen Son of Man, who is portrayed also as the Ancient of Days in Revelation 1. This is, this is the risen Christ, okay, the Lord, the one on the throne. And he's not saying, oh, you know, all that, all that new covenant stuff that I accomplished on the cross and through my resurrection and ascension, let's forget about all that and go back to the law. That's not the point. The point is, that God is speaking. That's why the trumpet imagery is used. And if you're Greco-Roman and you're thinking of Athena and Zeus, it's like, no, no, that isn't the voice here to pay attention to. It's the God of Israel. It's the risen Christ who is God in the flesh, who was and is and is to come. This is the voice of, of Christ the Lord who is God, who is identified with God. That, that's what the, the, the trumpet imagery serves to do, to put people on alert as to whose voice this actually is. This is Jesus speaking as God and with the authority of God. He is God's word. Okay, so just as God's word to Moses at Sinai was precipitated by the sound of a trumpet, okay, from the glory cloud. It's Exodus 19, 13, 19, 16. 1919, Exodus 2018. I mean, it happens several times there. You get the, this this trumpet sound from the glory cloud, and it's again, it is precipitating the you know the dialogue that God has with Moses. Okay, just as it announces that. Okay, this is supposed to take our minds back, and and since in 110 again, it's the it's the resurrected Christ who is alive forevermore, who has the keys, you know, to to death and Hades, all the stuff we've covered before. He is the one who's going to judge the living and the dead. All this. Listen up. <laughs> okay, this is the word of God. That's the whole point. Um, it, it, it's not terribly complicated, and, and you miss all of that if you see the word trumpet and you think, oh, it's the rapture. No, it actually isn't. And if you're going, if you're going to take that position— in terms of end time stuff, you, you really need to go somewhere else. This is not a good support for it. Let's move on to verses two and three. John writes, at once I was in the spirit and behold, a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. He who sat there had the appearance of Jasper, the Greek is Iaspus, and Carnelian, the Greek is Sardion. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the appearance of an emerald. That's Smaragdinos. Again, the throne and its occupant are pretty obvious, as is their correlation with Daniel 7, Isaiah 6, Ezekiel 1. You know, 1 Kings 22, we could throw that in there. It's a famous divine council scene. Again, all the stuff we talked about in, in part one. I want to spend a little time, though, on the gemstones. That's new information. The first two are also found in descriptions of the New Jerusalem, which is the dwelling place of God and his council, and, of course, believers in the end, okay, the end of the story, which would make sense because we have a throne in heaven. Where would we expect the throne to be? Well, God's house, okay? That, that, no surprise there. They're also used in the Septuagint, these first two terms, for the tabernacle. Again, it creates a link back into other sacred spaces, other houses of God, you know, that, that sort of thing. The first one of the three is also used in the description of Eden, Okay, when, when Eden gets its geography in Genesis 2.12. So you, again, you have these connections back to other, other cosmic you know, abodes of, of God. Now, Owen, uh, again, has some comment here uh, about the gemstones. I'm just going to read what he has in his commentary again. 
Throne scenes in Jewish apocalyptic literature do not usually use precious stones as metaphors for describing the throne of God. However, the throne vision in Ezekiel 1 it mentions several precious stones and metals. Again, Ezekiel 1, there we go again. So some of this vocabulary you'll find in Ezekiel 1. In some angelic epiphanies, he continues, precious stones can be used in the description. For instance, Daniel 10, 5, and 6. And that's going to describe the girdle, the body, and the legs of the angel. To a certain extent, John uses the precious stones drawn from the description of the heavenly Jerusalem in describing God and his throne. Three precious stones are used in the throne scene and in the description of the New Jerusalem. That would be jasper, and carnelian, and crystal is, is another one. Sapphire mentioned in the description of the throne in Ezekiel 126 occurs in Revelation only in 2119. So again, he makes the point that we just sort of summarized uh, before we got into his little section that this gemstone imagery is, is often going to be described the place where God lives. Okay. And if, if you've read Unseen Realm and if you've read the Demons book, you know, I, I, I use this very obvious fact to point out that we should not be looking at the stones in Ezekiel 28 as the, the stuff on the high priest's breastplate. The list does not match, but the list does match the divine abode language specifically, you know, in, you know, where God lives, specifically in the book of Revelation. So this Ezekiel 28, that the language there is not about the high priest, it's about the dwelling place of God, which of course in Ezekiel 28, that would make sense because you know, the, the, the context is Eden, the, the garden mountain of God, okay? So let's segue out of that. We don't want to spend any more time on Ezekiel 28. We've done that a lot on the podcast. The rainbow, let's talk about that. That also has Old Testament precedent. You know, on comments briefly that the rainbow is based on an allusion to the throne vision in Ezekiel 1, 27, and 28. So let's read Ezekiel 1, 27, because that's probably not the place that you would think about when you hear rainbow, it says here, upward from what had the appearance of his waist, this is the, the divine man on the throne in Ezekiel 1, the, the, the weird you know, wheels vision, upward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were gleaming metal like the appearance of fire enclosed all around. And downward from what had the appearance of his waist, I saw as it were the appearance of fire and there was brightness around him. So this, this is the, you know, this, this idea of brightness around the one seated on the throne, like, like think of an arc. Okay. You know, Owen says that there's, there's possibly an illusion, you know, this kind of language, you know, might be a reference back again, like all this other stuff is with the gemstones to Ezekiel 1, 27 and 28. Now for sure, you know, John has the God and, you know, has God enthroned as a man, that, that vision in Ezekiel 1 in view. Because, you know, we get this other vocabulary from Ezekiel 1 in Revelation 4. So, I mean, what Owen is saying is, that's legit, but, but there's, there's a little more to it. The Septuagint word for rainbow in Ezekiel 128, which is taxon, is not the word in Revelation. But the reiteration of the cherubim throne vision in Ezekiel 10 does use this word. So, you know, again, the, the connection back to Ezekiel's vision is legit. Uh, that's certainly, again, arguably part of what John is doing here. We do get the terminology in the in the the, 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 the weird throne, wheels, chariot vision in, in chapter 10. We do get the word that John uses in Revelation 4 here in the Septuagint of Ezekiel 10. We don't get it in Ezekiel 1, but we do get it in, in 10. But again, the description in Ezekiel 1 about this being surrounded by brightness. Okay, if you interpret that as there's, there's a, like a brightness encircling the one seat on the throne. Well, yeah, okay, that, that could be rainbow imagery. So Ezekiel 1 is in play here. But you're probably thinking of the bow, the rainbow, you know, as it's taken in Genesis 9, 13, after the flood. This is a famously difficult passage. There's you know, some, some oddities in it. Um, I think that's also on the table. And again, this isn't unique to me, but it, it's... This could also be a, a reference point for John, but in a different way, maybe not so much textually as, again, a teaching point. So Beale, in his New International Greek uh, text commentary on the book of Revelation, suggests that, quote, in general, in view of the judgments introduced by Revelation 4 and 5, there's lots of judgment going on, and, and later in the book, too, obviously, the rainbow shows 
that it is important from the beginning that God bear witness that even as judge, he will be gracious to his true people, unquote. And like, just as the rainbow was, you know, sort of was the sign of the promise that I'm not going to destroy all the life on the earth again. You know, so, so Beale's saying, well, it, you know, this, this bow idea here, this rainbow idea might signal to the readers of Revelation, it's going to be really bad. But God isn't going to destroy everyone. Okay, the righteous will be saved and so on and so forth. It, it, it takes their minds back to the, the flood, you know, Genesis, and, and gives them some hope as well. I think this this point is expressed a little better, though, uh, by Gallas in his study of the throne motif in Revelation. I referenced this source. Uh, it, yeah, I think it was. Yeah, I think it was last episode. But Laszlo Gallas, throne motif in the book of Revelation, that book. He writes this. He says in Ezekiel 128, the divine splendor is likened to the mere appearance of a rainbow. So he's looping that in. While in Revelation 4.3, John sees a rainbow encircling the throne, which is compared to an emerald in appearance. As Bauckham concludes, so he's going to quote Bauckham here, the rainbow imagery, quote, moves from simile to reality. Though in John's vision, his throne vision, it primarily evokes the idea of God's glory. At the same time, it introduces the theme of covenant that is developed later in the book. Now, just think about that. The rainbow as a theme or sign of covenant. That's essentially what Beale was talking about in referencing back to Genesis 9, because God makes a covenant with Noah. Okay? So you have the same sort of thematic overlap. This is Revelation 4. You know, if we think in these terms, in a divine council courtroom scene that parallels Daniel 7 in over a dozen ways, in Daniel 7, it is God and his council that decrees and executes the fate of empires opposed to his people. In Revelation, God is going to judge empires as well. And he's going to use, John's going to use the Daniel 7 beast imagery in several passages for God's enemy. Yet the people of God are also going to be under severe persecution as things move toward a climactic end. You know, and again, here's where your, your end time systems, you know, not, I'll say get in the way, but they also have a way of coping with this. Your pre-trip rapture, oh, you know, those are Christians saved during the tribulation, fine. If you don't have a rapture, it's, it's just believers, okay, that, that are still left, you know, suffering, you know, sort of in, in the pathway of God's judgment here. So either way, I mean, this is an element. The people of God are under severe persecution as things move toward a climact again. The heavens and earth themselves will melt away. You know, it's an apocalypse, and, and people get hurt. <laughs> they get harmed and killed. But the sign of the rainbow is a reminder that God will not destroy all flesh. There will be a surviving remnant. He has made a covenant to that effect and will not forget it. The council will judge rightly in the end. God's enemies will be destroyed forever, ultimately, when we get to the end of the book of Revelation, again, either into everlasting torment or annihilation. Again, we've, we've talked about those, those two options in Q&As. Uh, either one is forever. God's enemies will be destroyed forever, but his children will not. They will become citizens and rulers at the end of days in God's house in the New Eden. So the rainbow imagery, again, has some some theological importance. And, and you know, it would offer to readers, hey, go back and remember, you know, God said he would never, you know, that it's not going to be a total annihilation. It's going to be bad, but it's not going to be total. You know, the Lord will remember his people. Uh, even even those who you know who, who die, as we, we find out later in the book of Revelation, you know even those you know who are who wind up dead are going to be raised to life, and they will not. And that isn't the, the you know, their 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 death here is not the end of them. They will be raised to life, and they will live forever with the Lord in His house. So you know God's going to remember His promises. He's going to remember the covenant. Now, let's read verses 4 through 8 again. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were seven torches of fire, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And around the throne, on each side of the throne, there were four living creatures full of eyes, front in front and behind. 
First one's like a lion, second like an ox, third one like a face of a man, fourth living creature had an eagle and you know like an eagle in flight. Okay, so let we'll just again pick up with that language that we had read earlier, and then of course we get the holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty right out of Isaiah six. Again, the contexts here are familiar. You know, most of these items, uh, though, are not only going to be familiar, but but a good number of them we've already seen and already discussed in earlier episodes because, you know, they, they, they appear or, or were relevant, you know, back in, in earlier discussions. So, for instance, the white garments and the crowns, again, we discussed those earlier in relation to Revelation 2.17 and Revelation 3.4 and 5 and Revelation 3.18. So we're not going to add anything to those. Lightning and thunder take us back to the Sinai theophany, which we just commented on in relation to the trumpet sound. So, again, that, that's repetition in, in that sense. We also get those storm and earthquake elements, and they're found not only here in Revelation 4 or 5, but found in other passages in Revelation, basically four passages in total. So Revelation 4 or 5, we get, from the throne came lightning and rumbling and thunder. Revelation 8 5, there's a reference to thunder and rumbling and lightning and an earthquake. Revelation eleven nineteen, there was lightning and rumbling and thunder and an earthquake and great hail, get, get the hail added. And Revelation 16, 18 through 21, then there were lightning and rumbling and thunder, and there was great a great earthquake and great hail. Now, On has a comment on these lists, you know, these four passages. He says, there's several things you know, we can observe about these lists. Storm phenomena forms the core, or form the core, of all four lists. Two lists in 11, 19, and 16, 18 through 21 are virtually identical. The theophanic use of storm phenomena. You know, other words, storm phenomena are often associated with the theophany, an appearance of God in the Old Testament. So these storm phenomena, such as lightning, rumblings, and thunder, grew out of the narrative of the Sinai theophany in Exodus 19, 16 through 18, where five phenomena are actually mentioned. Thunder, lightning, a thick cloud, a loud trumpet blast, and an earthquake. So again, it, it, it's pretty clear where this is going back to and, and where it's deriving from. You know, Revelation 4, 5, the seven spirits of fire identified with torches of fire. Can you get, you get the fire uh, imagery at Sinai as well? It, it, you know, again, the dwelling place of God. You know, to, to be broader about it, fire is sort of a stock element of the divine presence. I, I mentioned this in passing in Unseen Realm. I can't remember what chapter, but you will often see fire associated with, you know, an, an appearance of God. I mean, the, the, the most obvious one's like the burning bush, okay? That, that, that's pretty easy. But it, it's actually, a, again, a stock element. Um, Owen writes here, again, this is an interesting quote, since the view is frequently found in early Judaism that angels are made of fire, <laughs> it is possible that seven angelic beings are referred to here. Again, as the allegorical interpretation in verse 5c, the last part of verse 5 makes clear. Again, and this is all part of the, the seven spirits before the throne of God and the eyes of the Lord stuff that we've talked about before. You know, On points out, you know, some other people say that the seven blazing torches represent the menorah, but again, that would take us back to Zechariah 4 anyway. And you get into the seven spirits, the eyes of the Lord who turn out to be supernatural beings. So uh, again, this this connection of the fire image with, again, you know, he, he's using the word angels because that's sort of the, the, the throwaway word here. But again, supernatural beings around the throne, the seraphim, throne guardians, okay? that there, There's something really to be said for that in this language. It's it's not just isolated to this. Um, he, quotes, he quotes a couple, you know, uh, passages from the, some pseudepigrapha text, some second temple material that mentions countless beings constitute a flame of fire who stand around the throne of God. So that's in the second apocalypse of Baruch, you know, 21.6. And fourth Ezra 8, 21 to 22, speaks of hosts of angels who stand before God's throne and had his command are changed to wind and fire, and so on and so forth. You know, now, again, this is a way that Supernatural beings, particularly you know, those who guard the throne, are described you know, in, in the Bible. And again, this, this imagery is drawn you know, from different places. You know, some, sometimes the context is Babylonian, sometimes the context is Egyptian. Again, if you've read Unseen Realm, this is going to be familiar territory to you. If you've read the Angels book, it's going to be familiar. 
As I noted in Unseen Realm, those Seraphim in Isaiah 6 could also likely be serpentine in appearance from the noun seraph. Uh, it just depends. What, what does seraph come from? Is it the noun? That would be a serpent. Is it the verb, you know, to burn? Then, then it would be a fiery one. Well, you, you can have them both if you're talking about spitting cobras, and I bring this up in the Unseen Realm, and I draw on uh, an article by uh, Provencal, his study of seraph, you know, is the most extensive one. And I you know, quote that in, in the Unseen Realm about this point. And it's, it's language drawn from e- Egyptian religion, you know, where, where, you know, spitting cobras that would, you know, have has had this fiery venom, you know, would, would guard the throne of the deity. And again, you get the seraph idea, seraphim idea of throne guardians that protecting, you know, the, the sacred space of the deity from defilement and all this sort of stuff. Again, both of these things can be true. It's probably, you know, best to see the, uh, you know, the, the imagery here is, is a both and, not an either or. But you actually don't need Isaiah 6 for the notion that supernatural beings can manifest as fire or be described in those terms, or that fire is a stock element of God's presence. You get those ideas in other passages like Exodus 3, burning bush, pillar of fire, Exodus wanderings, Deuteronomy 33, 2, even though there's a textual issue there. Uh, you know, we, we get this either a fiery law or, or, or fire associated with the, with a multitude, you know, of, of the heavenly host at Sinai giving the law. Again, I discussed that in Unseen Realm as well. You have the fact that God sends fire from heaven, Sodom and Gomorrah. Okay. Psalm 104.4 says he makes his messengers winds and his ministers a flaming fire. And that, there's a lot of Old Testament imagery that uses fire. And again, that, that's not to the exclusion of, of serpentine imagery. It's, in, in my view, it's, it's a both and, it's not an either or. But this is where, again, this, this thinking sort of comes from. And you know, look at what we have. We've got all these elements here in Revelation 4, and they can all be found with God's you know, presence at Sinai. And you say, well, you know, not, not you know, the, the, again, the, the serpentine thing. Well, oh, okay, that, that's true. But you still get myriads of angels there. Again, just go back to Unseen Realm and read the section about where does, that, does, does this idea that the law was dispensed by angels come from? Okay, that's where we discussed it in the book. So you actually do have all the elements here, maybe not in every every facet or every from every angle, but this is very clearly an association with Sinai, because Sinai is where God lives. That doesn't mean, though, that it's not is associated with Ezekiel 1, because Ezekiel 1, again, has all this imagery too, and more that you get looped into Revelation 4. Again, I'm going to stop here and remind you, this is what John does. He doesn't just go to one passage. Now, I'm going to write about this, and I want you to go look at this Old Testament passage because I'm going, to, I'm going to take some things from that Old Testament passage and teach you something. No, what John does is, I want, to, I want to say something here, or this is what I saw, and I'm going to relate what I saw. And he winds up drawing the information from four or five passages. And you're just supposed to know how to parse all that out. He combines things. He amalgamates things. This is why, again, it, it, it's messy. It's not just a clean citation of one, one thing. He puts them all in a blender, and that's what you get. And that's what he's doing here. So, you know, when we, when we do all this talk about Sinai and God's appearance there, doesn't mean we're not talking about Ezekiel 1, Isaiah 6. They're, we're talking about all of it. Okay. If you look at the creatures that surround the throne of Revelation 4, 6, 8 on the surface, they're the cherubim from Ezekiel 1. But the fact that their wings are numbered at 6 is a detail not found in Ezekiel 1. There, the cherubim have four wings. The six count comes from Isaiah 6 and the seraphim. So again, we have this blending of sources. John is combining the descriptions. There's also an interesting modification. It's a, it's a combination, but I'm going to use the word modification because of the way John puts the two together. In Ezekiel 1 and Ezekiel 10, the cherubim are not said to have eyes or be full of eyes. The eyes and the things full of eyes are the wheels. The wheels have have the eyes. The wheels are full of eyes, not not the cherubim. And Ezekiel 10, 12, actually, I'm just a sidebar here, is not inconsistent with that. It just depends how that verse is translated in English versions. So I'm not going to rabbit trail on that. But in Revelation 4, the term is living creatures. Okay, he doesn't actually call them cherubim. I mean, John could have done that. But it's interesting he calls them living creatures. 
He doesn't call them cherubim or seraphim. And it's the living creatures who are full of eyes. And the point is not that they have eyes, but that they are filled with eyes. They are full of eyes. So why why does John blend these things and then sort of mix the data points from those things in the way he describes the throne scene in Revelation 4 and 5? I think what he's doing here is actually conceptually consistent with Ezekiel 1. This is, this is where you don't really so, so much see this in Isaiah 6. But, you know, Isaiah 6 has some elements. Again, God does have throne guardians. They're just described differently because we have an Egyptian context there. But let's just track on Ezekiel 1 because that's, that's where the eyes imagery comes from. So I think for sure, you know, John has something to communicate here in the context of Revelation 4 and 5, in the context of an apocalypse, that, that God's enemies are going to get judged. The nations are going to get judged. All the wicked are going to get judged. God is sovereign. That is a conceptual point that is conveyed in Ezekiel 1 using astrological or astronomical imagery from Babylonian religion. Okay, those, of, those of you who have, you know, have followed my content for a while, I have a blog post on this, uh, you know, on my website about how we have things in Ezekiel 1 that very clearly point to the Babylonian zodiac and astral imagery that are used to make a very specific point about who controls time and history. It is not Marduk of Babylon. It is the God of Israel. And even though in Ezekiel 1, the Jews are sitting there, they're captives, they're in a foreign land. You know, they've been thrown out because of their apostasy. God, their God, is the one still on the throne. That, that's the whole point of Ezekiel 1, and it's communicated through this astral imagery. And I'm, I'm going to try to summarize it here. You know, John is, it wants to communicate the same thing. All hell is going to break loose on earth. It's going to be terrible. The righteous will suffer. Yes, there will be a remnant. Remember you know, what the flood was like. God did save a remnant. He promised he would not you know, annihilate everyone. There will always be a remnant. And even if, if the righteous die, they will be resurrected and be with the Lord at the end. We, we find that out at the end of the book of Revelation when all this comes full circle. So he's reminding them of that, but he's also reminding them of, of what's, what the teaching point of Ezekiel 1 is. The God of Israel is the one in control of the cycles of time and history. Nobody else is. So here in Revelation 4 and 5, the context is a divine council meeting. The council meets to begin unleashing God's judgment on the earth, and the wicked will be punished, the righteous will be vindicated, martyrs will be avenged, supernatural powers will be destroyed, the nations will ultimately be healed, but in the course of doing all that, it's going to be really bad. You know, and finally, Eden will return to earth. It is the day of the Lord time. And just as Ezekiel's imagery conveys cosmic sovereignty, so does John's. That's the conceptual overlap. John is consistent here. He's just throwing lots of things into the blender. Uh, I, I think for new listeners, I, I probably ought to rabbit trail a little bit as to explain why I take this, this tack that I do on Ezekiel 1. And so I'm, gonna, I'm just going to quote from uh, some stuff I've been working on in terms of writing, you know, this, this, this book that I've been working on for years, and maybe I'll never have an end. The book is about the use of an abuse of astronomy and sacred calendar in end times thinking. And, and here's what I write about Ezekiel 1 and Revelation 4. So I have a little section on this. It is well known that Ezekiel's vision included wheels within wheels, whose rims were tall and awesome and full of eyes. That's Ezekiel 1, 17 through 18. Again, that's important about the rims, the observation with the rims. That the eyes, again, are within the heavenly throne creatures in Revelation 4 is interesting. It's important. And of course, the eyes on the rims that are full of eyes in Ezekiel 1, you know, what are these things? What are these things? So you know, just to, to draw a little bit more, you know, from this thing I've, I've been writing, working on, I write this, Old Testament scholar Daniel Block notes that the word translated eyes, okay, the word for eyes is ion, in Ezekiel 1, 17 and 18, had been used earlier for sparkle or gleam in the same chapter of Ezekiel, Ezekiel 1, 4 and Ezekiel 1, 16. So the same word is used for eyes and for sparkling and gleaming. And this may point the way to its interpretation here. Sparkling and gleaming are, of course, familiar descriptions for what? Stars. Throughout ancient literature, by the way, 
Block elsewhere makes the important observation that the four faces of the cherubim in Ezekiel's vision correspond to the four signs for the cardinal direction points. Okay. We could get in a little footnote here where, you know, what about the difference between the four faces between Ezekiel 1 and 10? And again, you know, Block has a nice explanation for that. Basically, it depends on on which way the things are oriented. And I'm not going to rabbit trail there, but but the, the two visions are actually consistent here. There's not a contradiction. So we have here Block, you know, making the point that, hey, if you look at the faces of the cherubim in Ezekiel's vision, lo and behold, they correspond to the four cardinal points of the of the zodiac in Babylon. They just do. These compass points, these cardinal points, in turn, had correspondence again, to what the Babylonians you know, were, were thinking, what they thought in what they were trying to communicate by having a zodiac. Now, just to go a little, a little bit more, these points are noteworthy. They were not overlooked by the Apostle John in the New Testament. The heavenly throne seen in Revelation 4 and 5 borrows this terminology and other elements in Ezekiel 1. We've seen a bunch of those today. He borrows them to describe heavenly creatures this time, full of eyes in front and behind, Revelation 4, 6. And here I quote another scholar, uh, Pilch, in a Revelation commentary. As Pilch notes, this is one of the ways that the ancients described stars, and specifically constellations. Animals, creatures, full of eyes. And again, the terminology for eyes also being used for gleaming and sparkling in the same chapter of Ezekiel 1. You say, well, in Ezekiel 1, they're in the rims. Right, right. Rims are what? Things that go in circles. Wheels go in circles. And the zodiac goes in a circle. Okay? The ancients called stars eyes and thought them to be living entities. Constellated stars made full of eyes were perceived as animate beings like persons or animals. Since Ezekiel uses all four constellations moving at once, his vantage point was high above the entire cosmos. Ezekiel is describing the heavenly throne chariot of Yahweh. It's a stock description of God's throne chariot. The the, the divine throne in biblical days was just what Ezekiel described, supported by, you know, cherubim, these winged, you know, creatures. It had wheels. I mean, all the elements are there. And you could you could go out on the web and and you know find my blog post on this. You'd probably find a few, you know, pictures as well. Again, this is just the way you describe a the throne of a king or the throne of a deity. This is the throne in Ezekiel 1 of, of Yahweh. The Hebrew term often translated chariot is Merkava. The plural is Merkavot. And you'll find it in Joel 2 5, Zechariah 6 1, for example. Like typical ancient throne chariots known from scripture and other art, Yahweh's Merkava is surrounded and supported by cherubim. Since Yahweh's Merkava is in the heavens, those cherubim are quite naturally part of the visual sky. Consequently, Ezekiel's comments about the stars being in both the wheels and, again, factoring in the the cherubim images, it's not, I mean, it's consistent. It's consistent. He is seeing the constellations move through the heavens in their regular cyclic path, which forms a wheel. Wheels are circular. The wheels within wheels is a way of symbolically describing the stars, constellations in their courses. Stars and constellations do what? They mark time. The messaging of Ezekiel 1 has a very specific aim. Ezekiel's vision proclaims to the captives from Judah exiled in Babylon that the heavenly king who controls the cycles of time and history is not Marduk, the chief deity of Babylon at the time, but Yahweh of Israel. That John uses the cherubim imagery and describes living creatures filled with eyes is significant. In his context, not of the eyes of Ezekiel earlier, it seems pretty clear he's describing constellations in heaven, or or the heavens, which of course is where God lives and is enthroned. The messaging would be the same. God is in control of time and history. He and his council are about to make that quite clear as they render judgment throughout the rest of the book of Revelation. So this is why John does what he does. He's trying to communicate the same message. God is on the throne, and it's going to be the lamb, okay? The lamb's going to be part of this. 
We have the risen Christ described as the Ancient of Days who in Daniel 7 is on the throne. I mean, all of these things just sort of converge and merge together. Voice like a trumpet, the fire, the jewels, the white clothes. I mean, all of this stuff is drawn from divine counsel imagery. It's drawn from the place where God lives. It's drawn from the throne of God, which is in the heavens. And up, if we look at the heavens, we see creatures that move in in circles, cycles of time. Who's in control of time and history? Well, this is part of, 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 of the illustration, the complex, the understanding of the throne of God. God and who sits on thrones but kings, okay? So who is the king of time and the passage of time and history? And and who who you know how does history you know play out? It, it play out with, with nations, geopolitical entities, and people. Okay, who is in control of all that? God, Christ, the Lamb, the Son of Man. I mean the ancient of days. The answer is yes, okay? This is why John is doing what he's doing. He's trying to communicate the same theological messaging. Now you ask logically, well, what's up with the 24 elders? (laughs) What's up with the 24 elders? And and that, at least, is a good place to stop for this episode. We're going to have a part three necessary for time. But the 24 elders are part of this. And the question is how? You know, like, how do we, you know, sort of what interpretive trajectory might we follow here? There's going to be several, several possibilities here. You know, is is this another astral image? Does the number 24 have some astral significance? That's one question. Or is the number related to the tribes of Israel and the apostles, 12 and 12? Uh, it would seem the latter, but the apostles aren't dead and glorified yet. At least, you know, at the very least, John is still alive, even with a late date for Revelation. If, if this is written in the earlier date, you're probably going to get more apostles alive. So, you know, why do we see them in you know, does that get in the way of seeing them as as the second twelve unit? Uh, you know, up, up here at the throne, uh, you know, does that does that bother that idea, that approach? You know, it, does seeing twenty four as including glorified apostles, some of whom aren't dead yet, is is that is that awkward? Maybe it seems a little bit awkward. Does it matter? Does the number twenty four have some other meaning that would align with the more general cloud of witnesses? Human believers as part of the council idea. We talked about that in the book of Hebrews. Again, we'll go through the options next time. That's what we're going to do in part three, and, and hopefully in part three, we'll do that and then loop some of the stuff that that might be new as we go into and through chapter five. Uh, again, just try to get through Revelation four and five, but there's just a lot of stuff here. It's cluttered, it's dense. Again, this is what John does. So we're in another one of these passages where. He's just letting it fly, and you're supposed to know where the pieces come and what he's doing when he puts them together. All right, Mike, I'm glad you brought it up because you do owe us an astral prophecy book. So what, when can we expect <laughs> no, that? What's going on? Yeah, 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 yeah I know. <laughs> I know. Uh, I'm serious. What's what's the holdup? I know. I You know. There's just too many other things I'm working on, so yeah. But it seems like you're kind of far down the it, road. It's on both this an book. excuse and a reality. You know, yeah. I'm just I'm always in that sort of situation. Yeah. Well, I'm going to stay on you because that uh, I th- I personally think that book would be uh, a good book. And you read some of it. That's the first time we've heard any of it, right? Yeah. Well, it, I don't know. It might be. I it think might it is. Be. I don't know. If I think I that's. That. Yeah. Yeah. I like what I'm hearing, and I, I, I need that book, done, Mike. Please. Just between me and you, just read that book, please. But uh, all right, that's that's good stuff. I love it. All right, part three. Looking forward to it. And uh, with that, I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. 
To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Hyde's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com. Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 368, Revelation for part three. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's a scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike. Well, how are you doing this week? I'm doing fine. Um, but, you know, I've I've heard that Texas is overrun with Neanderthals. You guys are Neanderthals. You yeah. know, I, when I heard uh, that the president say that after Texas opened up, I thought, well, that's just, that's just really unfortunate timing because it would have been great to interview Josh Swamidas today because yeah. then we could really talk about like living Neanderthals. Well, we can still point people back to those two episodes, but uh, yeah, <laughs> as one of the Neanderthals speaking um, here, representing uh, all Neanderthals in Texas, uh, you know, we appreciate that. We actually, what does that say about us that we actually take that as a compliment? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, yeah. You know, what does that mean? <laughs> I don't. I don't know. I don't know that I want to touch that, but. <laughs> Yeah, I, I guess I that's better than than having Josh on here and talking about Neanderthal interbreeding or something. You know, yeah. it's probably yeah, got, less offensive. I got friends on Facebook and whatnot changing their uh, profile pictures to Neanderthals, you know, headshots <laughs> and stuff. Great. And it's just like, well, we're pretty proud of that. Like that's a badge of honor to be called that. So, uh no hurt feelings over here. Uh, in Texas. Any any sports franchise is going to change their name. Oh, that'd be perfect. Yeah, that's a perfect uh, excuse to change your name. Yeah. But I'm sure somebody. Well, maybe uh, people maybe people could, would forget about the Cowboys. You know, of a year ago, ooh, if they just changed it easy. to the Dallas Neanderthals. Easy. If we start winning, <laughs> I don't think people would complain. But yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, Mike, we uh, any Neanderthals in Revelation four today? No, this is the last no, not- part. Of, of chapter four yeah is there anything in the bible no i I, no. I looked i looked but i couldn't find any yeah <laughs> so, <laughs> unsuccessful there that's unfortunate but doesn't have texas doesn't in mean... there it doesn't have texas in no. the bible really because no. there's lots of texans no. think that texas is in the bible well you know, I made no, that you're up, gonna have so, to correct them it's yeah. tell them the book of revelation is all about america not just okay. texas How's oh that? okay well us texans only yeah. think about texas not really the union, so right. you know we're yeah. a little just just like just like a lot of people conflate Israel and America. You guys conflate America and Texas, right? Yeah. There you go. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, that's exactly what I'm saying. <laughs> I'm, I'm saying Texas is the new Israel. Is that what I'm saying? <laughs> filled with the filled with yeah, the Neanderthals, boy. <laughs> yeah, I'll, uh, I'll look for this. I'll look for this on an Ancient Aliens episode to come. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll probably get that. Giorgio, some... if you're listening, there you go. You can, you know, you can thank me later. Maybe, maybe I get a royalty for that. I'm waiting for another show to quote our show or do something like that. That'd be, you know, wouldn't that be fun if we popped up <laughs> on The Simpsons or, you know, something random? That'd be awesome. Be well, part of pop culture. So you you think of the fun side. I think of, you know, it's it sort of makes the hair on the back of my neck stand up but you know, yeah no i get what all people the, might do <laughs> yeah lots of people are like this is a bible show y'all need, don't need to talk about sports and aliens and stuff it's like well see now we're including neanderthals so we're wide we the yeah, yeah but we're gonna get some blowback i'm gonna get some emails chewing me out for having too much fun oh. on the bible show all right what all right, well, well, we don't want you to have any more fun, so let's just start into Revelation 4. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. Uh, all right. Yeah, this is part three. Um, you know, as it worked out, you know, this is, this is just the way things fell. I, I didn't want to loop chapter five in here, so we're going to do a discrete episode on chapter five to wrap up these two that are, you know, this divine council throne room scene. We're going to spend today really just co- covering a couple of verses that deal with one item, and that is the 24 elders. So I'm going to just read where they show up in chapter 4. I mean, they're, they're going to pop up in chapter 5, too, but you know, by then we'll have already have covered it. So Revelation 4.4 4 says, Around the throne were 24 thrones, and seated on the thrones were 24 elders. 
clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. Then if you skip ahead a little bit, you hit verses 9 and 10, the first, first part of verse 10, which read, And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who is seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who is seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. So the, the question is kind of obvious here. You know, who or what are the 24 elders? And there are two possible trajectories in the Old Testament for the language uh, here, the elder language, though not really the number, at least in, in terms of being explicit. So I'm going to quote here, um, you know, just to sort of summarize the, the two trajectories, or at least, you know, get us into this, this part. I'm going to quote uh, Ahn's commentary again, in Revelation 1 through 5, his first of three volumes in the Word Biblical Commentary series. He says, there are two Old Testament passages in which a group of elders is depicted as present before Yahweh. Number one, Isaiah 24, 23, which describes an eschatological event. Then he quotes it. For the Lord of hosts will reign on Mount Zion and in Jerusalem. And before his elders, he will manifest his glory. And secondly, Exodus 24, 9 and 10. That's the narrative of the 70 elders who accompanied Moses up to Mount Sinai, where they had a vision of God. And On says the author may have derived his conception of 24 elders surrounding the heavenly throne of God from these two passages, or may at least be alluding to them. And that's the end of his quote. Now, again, those are the two sort of directions you could go. Obviously, well, maybe not obviously, but if you've read Unseen Realm, you know that I take Isaiah 24, 23 as describing uh, celestial elders, supernatural beings, you know, divine counsel, not humans. And of course, Exodus 24, you do have humans. We have Moses and Aaron and Nadav and Avihu and the 70 elders. You know, they, they go up Mount Sinai and they see the God of Israel and have a feast, have a meal. So we, we have sort of a celestial, divine, and a human trajectory, one of, one of each. And it, it, you know, these are the two paths you could go. Now, just a, a heads up, I'm going to suggest at, at, at one point here, when we go through the material, that you don't really need the dichotomy. Uh, the dichotomy is a bit of a false dichotomy. But for the sake of starting off, there you go. Now, the identity of the elders, Beale writes, um, or wait, this is not Beale, this is Baumgarten. I brought in an article, Joseph Baumgarten, uh, who wrote an article called The Duodecimal Courts. Duodecimal is a term that refers to 12, 12 themes. The duodecimal courts of Qumran, Revelation, and the Sanhedrin. It's from the Journal of Biblical Literature. Uh, it's a 1976 article. So he, he makes the comment that the identity of the elders, quote, has been one of the longstanding and still unresolved problems in the interpretation of Revelation, unquote. So Beale, sort of building off that, summarizes the interpretive options adduced by scholars. Now, again, you have these two trajectories, but, uh, you know, the two trajectories have produced a, a number of interpretive, you know, approaches to this. So Beale writes, now a heavenly entourage around the throne is pictured in Revelation 4. The elders have been variously identified as one, stars from an astrological background, two, angels, three, Old Testament saints, that would be people, you know, the righteous, Four, angelic heavenly representatives of all saints, both Old and New Testament. Five, patriarchs and apostles representing the Old Testament and New Testament saints, again, the righteous together. And six, representatives of the prophetic revelation of the 24 books of the Old Testament. Of course, that would be according to the Hebrew or Hebrew arrangement and canon and all that. Now, nobody really spends much attention on that last one. So, and, I, and I'm not going to either, because the other ones are so, so much better options. Baumgarten observes that the, quote, the church fathers and ancient commentators generally took the 24 elders to be glorified saints and glorified righteous people. Some modern exegetes have tried to advance the view that they were angels. Recently, there has been a return to the former option, again, the, the glorified righteous saints, but no adequate rationale for the number 24 has been offered. So, unquote. Again, Baumgarten 
basically saying we've got problems here. Now, consequently, most of the discussion about the 24 elders has been oriented to really the second through the fifth options. Angels, Old Testament saints, angelic representatives of all the saints in both testaments, or patriarchs and apostles, again, also representing Old and New Testament saints. So those options two through five, so four options there. And that's really where the discussion lives. And at, and at times, the distinctions between them are pretty blurred. Now, each of those options has some connection to the Old Testament. After all, this series is the old you know, Re- book of Revelation's use of the Old Testament. Uh, all of these ha- have some connection to the Old Testament. And Beale sort of is illustrative where, where he kind of lands. You're going to see that, that the lines are blurred uh, in, the, in the list that he himself gave. He writes, the elders certainly include reference to Old Testament and New Testament saints. So you know, he's going that way. They are either angels representing all saints or the heads of the 12 tribes together with the 12 apostles, representing thus all the people of God. So he, he kind of merges two or three of these options. Beale, you know, supports his reasoning uh, in this regard by noting that earlier in the book, a close relationship between angels and the people of God is suggested via the lampstand imagery, which applies to the churches and in its Old Testament source, Zechariah 4, divine beings in the presence of God. He also notes, again, Beale also notes the white garments and crowns worn by the elders. Okay, they're, that's what they're wearing. These are items associated with human believers who keep their faith until the end. And again, you know, this is well-traveled turf in the last few episodes, but the allusion here specifically is to Revelation 2.10, Revelation 3.4, and 3.11. And then, again, to follow that, he writes this. Beale says, The readers are given a look into heaven to see that the saints of old, together with the deceased Christians who have persevered, and think of the white robes and crowns here. That's how he's tying in the, the martyrs here. The readers are given a look into heaven to see that the saints of old, together with deceased Christians who have persevered, have received the heavenly reward of crowns, white clothing, and kingship. The readers can be assured that they too will receive a like reward if they are faithful to the end. In Revelation, angels never wear, right, wear crowns or white clothing, or sit on thrones. That one's debatable, because again, if that's where you fall with the 24 elders, that, he would not be correct there. But what, what he's saying is that you'll never see the, the word angel, you know, sitting on a throne. Okay, okay, that, that much is fair, but it's a, it's a bit of a misdirection. So back up here. In Revelation, he says, angels never wear crowns or white clothing or sit on thrones. But such descriptions are predicated only of saints, again, the, the righteous, who are in heaven. He cites Revelation 7, 13 through 15, 19, 7 through 8, and 19, 14. So they're predicated only of saints who are in heaven or of the saints' reward after death as a result of their perseverance. And here he cites Revelation 2, 10, Revelation 3, 4, and 5, 3, 21, and chapter 20, verse 4. So that's where Beale lands. A little bit, a little bit of a blurring of distinction, but he's definitely, I'd say it's fair to say, the majority of his thinking is sort of on, on, the, on the human trajectory, or at least the glorified human trajectory. Now, other scholars have opted for 12 representatives of, of Israel's original tribes and the 12 apostles by analogy to the two 12s of Revelation 21. So let's not forget about this 12 and 12 thing in Beale's list. And so some say, well, hey, look at Revelation 21 where the gates of the New Jerusalem correspond to the 12 tribes of Israel, but the foundations correspond to the apostles. So you got 12 and 12, obviously equaling 24. So the reasoning is that the New Jerusalem symbolizes the new Israel, comprised of the first people of God, Old Testament Israel, and the new Israel, the church. Okay, so this is, again, another notion that is sort of, you know, is on the human trajectory, but it's, it's more symbolic, the 12 and 12, the, the, the tribes and the apostles. Now, what Beale says and what, and again, what these other scholars would say, again, the, the predominantly human trajectory, you know, all, all that is true, but there are outliers in the data. For example, members of God's council may lack crowns, but they do sit on thrones. That's Daniel 7, 9 through 10. And, and if we've learned anything about Revelation 4 up to this point, 
it tracks Daniel 7, like 14 points in the same order. And the celestial heavenly host in Daniel 7 is meeting. It's a divine council meeting. It's a divine courtroom. And they have some participatory role in, the, in you know, God making a decision here. They open the books, you know, the, the, all of these motifs that we've talked about before. So, yeah, okay, they don't have crowns, but they do have some authority here. They do have a participatory role. They participate in his governance, in God's governance. Further, Isaiah 24, 23, let me make sure I get that number right. Isaiah 24, 23, yep, references Yahweh's elders. Again, this is a passage I talk about in Unseen Realm. And I suggested there, and will continue to suggest, that the most plausible interpretation of that passage is Yahweh's celestial supernatural counsel, not human beings. Okay. Now, I reference an article in Unseen Realm by Timothy Willis in this regard. It, the title of it is Yahweh's Elders, Isaiah 24, 23, subtitle, Senior Officials of the Divine Court. Okay, that's a 1991 article. So let's... I'm going to drift back into that just a little bit here. You know, while there are Old Testament passages that suggest the eventuality of believers being glorified as members of the Heavenly Family Council, okay, well, while that idea is, is foreshadowed, that in the end, you know, believers will, I mean, just to, to quote Genesis 15, and this will take, take your minds back if you're a longtime podcast listener to our conversations with David Burnett, about the star seed in Genesis 15, 6, when, when God takes Abraham out, shows him the stars of the sky, and he says, you know, your descendants, your offspring are going to be like the stars of heaven. And how that's not only a quantitative statement, but in Second Temple, Second Temple Judaism, and, and of course also suggested in the New Testament, it's also a qualitative statement. That eventually your seed, those who are the seed of Abraham, i.e. believers, are going to be like the stars of heaven, which were considered, again, you know, the sons of God, angels, okay, if you want to use that term. So, you know, that's true. There's this foreshadowing, but, but despite that, there's no explicit Old Testament reference to the idea sort of being current, like happening now or, or in the past or something that's already going on like you get in the, in the New Testament. I mean, you, you get this language in Revelation you know, 4 and 5, you know, with the martyrs. You get it in Hebrews 12, the cloud of witnesses. You know, they're in, enrolled in the, you know, among the, the you know, celestial you know, group in heaven there. Let, let me just quote Hebrews 12 here. Uh, we recently did an episode on this, but just to capture the wording again, uh, the whole cloud of witnesses uh, episode. But I think what's really important in that passage are Verses 22 through 23. So verse 1, everybody knows, therefore, since we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, blah, 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 blah. And we talked in that episode about what the cloud of witnesses means. And I think key to understanding it are verses 22 and 23 in the same chapter. But you, again, he's talking to believers, have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. And to God, the judge of all, the spirits of the righteous made perfect. Of course, this is the same book, Hebrews, back in Hebrews 2, where believers are introduced to God and God to believers in, in, in the midst of the congregation, the midst of the council. So, so we, we get the book of Hebrews and we get you know, other New Testament books that, that sort of have this already but, but not quite yet feel to it. But that goes beyond the Old Testament. Now, why am I belaboring the, this point? Because if the concept goes beyond the Old Testament, if all the Old Testament really offers here is a foreshadowing that that's going to be associated in the future with the Messiah, with the kingdom, the new Jerusalem, let's even throw a new covenant in there. Okay, that, that's what Daniel 12 would be talking about, the end of days. Okay, all the Old Testament can do is foreshadow this. Then, by definition, Yahweh's elders in Isaiah 24, 23 are not humans. That's the divine council, you know, made up of, of celestial beings only. That's the point. That's why I'm belaboring it. You know, Isaiah 24, 23 is prior to these New Testament passages and prior to Second Temple material, which makes it all the more likely a reference to the heavenly host council. Now, 
before I, well, I might as well just quote. Um, I think I have a little bit here from Willis. Let me make sure. Now, this is from this is what I said about Willis and Unseen Realm. So I'll, let me let me throw this out here. Uh, I, I wrote in Unseen Realm, the inclusion of martyrs in the scene in Revelation 6, 9 through 11, a little bit later, seems to require that the elders are also distinct from glorified believers. Okay, if you actually go look at Revelation 6, 9 through 11, let's take a peek there. Revelation 6, 9. We're talking about outliers to Beals. You know, these are these are glorified righteous, okay? Again, they're, they're, that, yeah, okay. What he said, how he defends that is okay, but again, he he doesn't address the outliers. So in Revelation six nine, we read, "When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God, and for the witness they had borne." Okay, there's the martyred righteous. They cried out with a loud voice, "O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth?" Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of the fellow servants and their brothers should be complete and who were killed, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. Now the, again, the, these, you know, souls of those, you know, you know, under the altar, this shows up in, in the Revelation 4 and 5 scene and, and they have to be distinct from the elders is the point. So that mars the, the neatness of what, Beale is arguing for in terms of the human trajectory. Uh, I'll say one more thing before moving on. The whole notion about the Old Testament foreshadowing, the the glorification of human beings, again, this qualitative concept that, that believers will be made like the stars and so on and so forth. You know, th- this is actually really important because in Second Temple Jewish literature, this is a significant theme. Burnett, again, Dave Burnett, when we had him on, uh, we, we talked about a little bit about this, but if you really want the detail, you should go to my website, drmsh.com, and there's actually a blog series written by David Burnett on Paul's use of Genesis 15.5. You know, 15.5, uh, he, I think he's he is pretty restricted to 15.5, not, not 6. But Paul's use of Genesis 15.5 in Romans 4.18 in light of early Jewish deification traditions. So if you want, you know, the detail to this, how the, the promise given to Abraham is not just quantitative, but qualitative. It speaks of believers being glorified and being, you know, numbered among the, the stars of the divine council. But anyway, this is, a, this is important. It's an important idea because what it does is it, is it blurs both of those Old Testament trajectories. So what where I'm going to wind up here is that there's no reason to pick that we have to pick. Oh, is it is it the is it the glorified righteous, or is it the the divine council members? And the answer is yeah, yeah, because we are going to be members of the council, and the cloud of witnesses suggests that that's an already reality, but not yet. I mean, we're not at the end of days. We're not at ultimate glorification. Yeah, but these two things merge, and they get merged before the New Testament. The New Testament has this talk, you know, partakers of the divine nature. You know, you're already partakers of the divine nature. That, that's a passage in Peter. But yet we're not let, let glorified. You know, First John talks about our glorification. We, we have this already aspect and the not yet. And it's associated with, again, being members in God's heavenly family council. We are children and partners. Okay, this is what God wanted from the very beginning. So... In Second Temple literature, this idea, because people are looking back at Genesis 15.5, people are looking at other passages, and they come up with this, with the development of this concept. Now, On points out that Second Temple Jewish literature, again, has a lot of precedent for this, it has precedent for seeing the elders that occupy thrones around God himself as being members of the heavenly host. And again, that's going to turn into, again, this sort of merging or including glorified human believers in it. So, but but let's just start with, again, picking up on my, my slant here, because I I think Isaiah 24, 23 does speak of, of non-human, you know, celestial divine council members. And, and so somebody like on would say, yeah, you know, there's, there's good evidence for that too. In second temple literature, it's not just, you know, the human trajectory, although again, we're going to loop that in. But On writes, a more conventional conception of the arrangement of heavenly beings who surround God on his heavenly throne is for them to flank the throne on the right and the left, as in 1 Kings 22. 
and very familiar divine counsel passage. There can be no doubt, however, that the author understands the 24 elders as encircling the throne. So he's just commenting on the posture here and the arrangement. For the location of many thrones near the throne of God, see Daniel 7, 9. Again, we already cited that. And for the conception of one or more thrones in each of a series of heavens, apparently occupied by an angelic leader, see, and then he lists uh, some, some passages. Most of them for, are from the ascension of Isaiah. Uh, 714, 719, 724, 720. I mean, to basically read Isaiah, Ascension of Isaiah 7 and 8, uh, a little bit in chapter 9, a little bit in chapter 24, or chapter 11, excuse me. So it it's there. Now, where you get more of it, again, is when, when the human sort of, the idea that, that human righteous are, are part of an angelic priesthood. That, that's at Qumran. We'll get to that in a moment. But But that's where humans are looped into this. But the point here is that there are good reasons to take Isaiah 24, 23 as not including humans. And, and if that's the case, then why can't that idea be what John is thinking of in Revelation 4 and 5? He's thinking of, again, the celestial heavenly host in Isaiah 24, and he calls them elders. We've got Daniel 7, where God meets with his celestial council, and that is the model, that is that is the you know, that's the well from which Revelation 4 comes. So so why do we have to go all of a sudden and say, well, these must be people, glorified people? Why can't they be just divine council members? So that's the other side of this. So Beale leans toward the human, and lots of people do. There's There's this other argument for the divine, the celestial divine council. But again, as I've already hinted, these two things are, maybe they're, they're just not a necessary choice. Again, we don't have to really opt for one or the other. <sighs> Again, do, does, does it really matter? I mean, because you're going to have plenty of, of data for both. You know, are the 24 elders of Yahweh's council human believers in heaven or celestial members of the heavenly host? In biblical thought, the question really seems like a moot one, because human believers are destined to be glorified and joined to the divine council. Now, this is a familiar idea to those of you who are familiar with my content, Unseen Realm, have listened to the podcast before. But I want to track through some of what I wrote and then go into uh, the Qumran material just to show you how these these things get merged or, or can be merged, or at least in the Second Temple period on in toward the first century that this is happening. So in the book of Revelation, let's just start there. Jesus is not only referred to as the morning star but he grants the morning star to believers. This is one thread. The implications are noteworthy. I wrote in Unseen Realm that the morning star phrase takes us back once more to the Old Testament, which at times uses astral terminology to describe divine beings. Job 38 is the best example. The morning stars were singing together and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Stars were bright and in the worldview of the ancients, living divine beings since they moved in the sky and were beyond the human realm. The morning star language in Revelation 2.28 is messianic. It refers to a divine being who would come from Judah. We know this by considering two other passages in tandem. In Numbers 24.17, we read the prophecy that, quote, a star will go out from Jacob and a scepter will rise from Israel. Okay, that is not a reference to the, to the birth star, okay, because the star goes out from Jacob. Okay, the birth star didn't it's not a reference to the thing in the sky because Jacob, the tribe of Jacob, isn't in the sky. Okay, you know this is this is tribal talk. It, it the word star is used to say essentially that a divine being, specifically a divine king, because it's from Judah, okay, will arise. A scepter will rise from Israel. Numbers twenty four seventeen back to the quote was considered messianic in Judaism, completely apart from the New Testament writers. In other words, literate readers of John's writing would have known the morning star reference was not about literal brightness. It was about the dawning of the returned kingdom of God under its Messiah. Later in the book of Revelation, Jesus himself refers to his messianic standing with the morning star language. Revelation 22.16, I am the root and the descendant of David, the bright morning star. Later I wrote, as Daniel says, the righteous... Here's where we get the, you know, the righteous looped in again. The righteous will shine like the brightness of the sky above, like the stars forever and ever. Daniel 12, 2 and 3. 
Our inheritance of the nations with Jesus at the end of days, Revelation 3.21, is in a glorified, resurrected, i.e. divine state. The star language of Genesis 15, again, has this eschatological connotation. Now that thinking in Revelation, where you have celestial being and, and glorified human being spoken of in the same way, in this case, authority in the kingdom. Think of the council. Think councils have authority, all right? Where you blur, or, or at least merge is the better word, the, 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 the deity divine, okay, Jesus with, with human, you know, glorified believers. They're, they're members of the same body. Jesus, you know, share, says that he'll grant to the one that overcomes to sit on his throne with him in Revelation 3. And he will share with them the morning star, Revelation 2. Again, this is inclusion in the council and its inclusion in authority. Both sides, you know, start to, again, be blended here. This line of thinking is consistent with wider Second Temple Jewish thought that human believers, when glorified, will become members of God's heavenly entourage. This point of theology is well known from Second Temple Jewish sources and the literature of Qumran, especially, whose occupants saw themselves as an angelic priesthood. This belief in a presumed symbiosis between the earthly and heavenly priesthood servants of God may provide a point of connection to the number of the elders as well, which some suggest derives from the 24 priestly courses described in 1 Chronicles 23 and 24. Maybe that's where we get the 24. Maybe it's about a heavenly priesthood that is both divine but also earthly. You know, like, okay, we've, we've got, again, this merging going on. You know, consider the elements. Just, just think about the elements of the scene. Revelation 4 and 5 is based on Daniel 7, a council scene in which all authority is given to the Son of Man. Remember how Daniel 7 ends? All the authority is given to the Son of Man. The Son of Man, Jesus, is the morning star who shares his authority with human believers, especially, you know, specifically sharing his throne in Revelation 3.21. And he sets believers over the nations being judged in Revelation 2.26. To this, we could add the description in the book of Hebrews, again, where believers are part of a great cloud of witnesses, which is language drawn from celestial court imagery in ancient covenants. These believers have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. Oh, isn't that what's described in the book of Revelation? the new Jerusalem, the heavenly Jerusalem. You know, Hebrews 12 has believers coming to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to innumerable angels and festal gathering, and to the assembly of the firstborn who are enrolled. And they are enrolled in heaven. And those believers will, as Paul says, judge angels. 1 Corinthians 6.3. And the point here, is that a choice between glorified humans and celestial agents of the heavenly divine council isn't really necessary. The categories overlap. That's the point. So this is where, you know, at this point, you know, in the episode, this is where I'd say, this I, I think is a really good way to look at it. That the 24 elders, you know, okay, you got 12 and 12, 24. You know, I, I'm, not, you know I'm not bothered by the whole symbolic attempt here, but I think what, wherever you land on how you talk about the 24 elders, you need to affirm that the divine counsel, in terms of the supernatural character of it, is not denied. In other words, the humans don't squeeze, squeeze out the, 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 the divine elements here of the council. Rather, humans are included in the council. So however you want to talk about that, and again, you go back to Beale's five or six options, all the elements are there, both the celestial, again, the, if you want to use the word angelic element to the council, along with glorified humans. Yeah, they're, they're, all that stuff is there. So, so we need to find a way to talk about the 24 elders that includes both sides of the coin without squeezing one out or the other. Now, here's the wild card. What about the astral interpretation of the 24 elders? That was the first thing Beal listed. And I, I've mentioned this before. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, again, more or less just, just tell you where I'm going with this. The divine council in the Old Testament is described in very explicit astral language. And believers, glorified believers who will join the, the, the council, are described in very explicit astral language. Daniel 12 will shine as the stars. 
Genesis 15, you know, you'll be as the stars of the sky. Again, just go back and look at, read, read through the Burnett series and you get all the primary source data from the Second Temple period about this. In other words, Mike isn't making it up and neither is Dave Burnett. This is how they were thinking about this kind of stuff, this star language associated with the divine council. So would it really be inconsistent if we also looked at the 24 elders astrally, okay, as astral talk? And the short answer is no, it wouldn't. In fact, that, that would sort of lend another perspective to the same things we're talking about. Divine council, in this case, made up of supernatural beings and glorified humans. And, and, and the way we telegraph this idea is, is, is the astral talk from the Old Testament. Okay. Now, you know, I don't, obviously we're not going to take time on, on this episode to go through all the astral talk of the Old Testament. I've just given you a few, you know, passages, you know, to think about. There are, of course, more. You know, we've, we've had, we've hit Daniel 12 here. We've hit Genesis 15, 5. We've hit um, what was the Job 38, you know, the stars, you know, Isaiah 14, you could throw in there. I mean, there's plenty of this astral talk, you know, in the Old Testament. So let's just, let's just go down that trajectory a little bit and talk about, you know, what about the astral approach? Now, On and Beale are skeptical of the approach generally. They don't really seem to connect the dots here between glorified humans and the celestial star language stuff. I don't, I don't know why, because it's, it's not hard to see. Maybe it's just they're not used to, to looking at things that way. But again, it's not hard to see. And if you want the primary source data, go to the blog series uh, by, by Burnett. And you'll get references there too in bibliography. So On and Beale you are a little skeptical of the approach. They presume, maybe this is why, they presume the imagery must come from the Babylonian zodiac and that Old Testament correlations are more likely. Now, wait a minute. Are you suggesting then professors, that astral imagery in the Old Testament doesn't have a connection to Babylonian stuff. If you're suggesting that, you would be incorrect, Ezekiel 1. Okay, we'll get there in a moment. Now, it is true that the zodiacal system would have its point of origin in Mesopotamia. Okay, everybody sort of knows that. But all cultures of the Mediterranean region, including that of ancient Israel, the Second Temple Jews, they all utilize the zodiac for observing the celestial sky. So, so big deal if it comes from Babylon. Everybody used it. It's kind of like a, a meaningless objection. Plus, if you throw Ezekiel 1 in there, it's, it's kind of a misguided objection. Now, there's a good deal of evidence for Jewish astrological beliefs in Second Temple Jewish texts. And this evidence should not, let me emphasize this, this evidence should not be interpreted as a concession to heterodox pagan religion. Rather, Judaism held to its theological orthodoxy, parsing astronomical phenomena and astrological concepts through a belief in Yahweh as the ruler of the cosmos. You know, and this blend actually gets visible representation by zodiac mosaics in ancient synagogues. Yes, there are zodiac mosaics in ancient synagogues. Now, if you want, again, some, some sources here, just generally, um, something that's accessible online. I would say probably the best thing to look up on you know, using Google is, uh, look, author's name is Lester Ness, L-E-S-T-E-R-N-E-S-S, -E -S -S, Lester Ness, and you'll find his book, Written in the Stars, Ancient Zodiac Mosaics. Uh, it's his dissertation. He did his dissertation at the University, or Miami University of Ohio under uh, Edwin Yamauchi who is uh, an evangelical, and so is Lester Ness. But it's, it's a really good uh, dissertation. I think he teaches, I don't know if he still teaches, but he taught for many years in China, uh, Lester Ness did, um, but he put his dissertation online. So there you go, you can have it. Uh, it's also been published in hard copy form too. I mean, there are other sources that, um, you know, you can just you know, use Google Scholar for this sort of thing, Zodiac, Mosaics, Judaism, you're going to find lots of stuff. But anyway, that, that one's free and accessible. So back to the, to the point here, the fact that you could have zodiac imagery, who cares if it comes from Babylon? That, that's where astronomy stuff came from, and everybody's using it. Number two, well, so does Ezekiel 1. We don't, we don't look at Ezekiel 1 askance you know, for that. And, and third, we have primary source, primary, you know, primary source data, let's put it that way, 
that Jews did have zodiacal thinking as you know, in their theology, that it didn't steer them away from Orthodox Yahwism, because Yahweh was the one who created these objects, wasn't he? And he is their master. What, what, what Jews and later Christians rejected in terms of astrology stuff is the idea that the objects in the sky could, could dictate and control individual fate. That was theologically anathema, because only God is sovereign. Period. Okay? These things do not decree individual fate. They, they serve God. They serve their creator. Anyway, let's go back to the whole approach. You know, scholars who have championed the, uh, the astral zodiac approach are few. There aren't many of these. Uh, the most notable contemporary scholar is the late Bruce Malina. Uh, Dr. Malin uh, passed away a few years ago. Uh, he was a New Testament scholar specializing in applying the social sciences to New Testament culture and interpretation. And Malina argued for the astral view based on several textual considerations that were then parsed according to ancient astronomical or astrological thought. If you want to get sort of his whole commentary on Revelation, it's published in a book. It's still, you know, available on Amazon. It's called The Genre and Message of the Book of Revelation. And the subtitle is something about star journeys and visions or whatever, okay? Now, I've said before on the podcast that the, that the book has, I think, rightly been reviewed uh, negatively in that Malina neglects to connect this stuff to Old Testament material. I think that's a legitimate criticism. In other words, he he sees the astral road and, and gets on it and never departs and, and never bothers to, to sort of try to marry it to Old Testament material. That, that's, a, that's, a, that's a legitimate criticism. However... He has a lot of data, <laughs> you know, that, that really makes sense. So, so I, the last sentence I, or sentence a, a few seconds ago, I said something like, you know, what Malin is arguing for is he, he's looking at the text. And there are certain features of, of, the, of the Revelation 4 and 5 vision that John has. And, and, he, and he pulls those out. He observes those things. And then he interprets them according to ancient astronomical, astrological thought. Here, let me give you some examples. Of, of how this this approach would, would sort of work. First, the throne of Revelation 4 and 5 is, drumroll please, heavenly. In other words, it's said to be in the heavens. Revelation 4, 1 and 2, it just says that point blank. So Malin is like, well, why don't we consider the heavens then? If that's where the vision you know, is, is sort of situated. Number two, God's throne is situated above the firmament. We know this from the Old Testament. And the firmament was conceived as this solid dome over the earth in ancient cosmology. It's this, we're talking about the firmament created in Genesis 1-6 that separated the waters below it from the waters above it. In Genesis 1-6 is your verse. You could compare that to Proverbs 8, 27 and 28, Job 37, 18, which has the, the, the firmament being solid and hard as brass and, and this, this kind of language, okay? God, in the Old Testament, quote, walks upon the vault, in this firmament, the vault of heaven. He walks on it, Job twenty two fourteen, Psalm 29, 10 says, the Lord sits enthroned over the flood. In other words, over these waters up there above the firmament. God builds, quote, he builds his upper chambers in the heavens and founds his vault upon the earth. Amos 9, 6, the dome rests upon the earth and God lives above it. In Revelation 4, 5, meteorological phenomena emanate from the throne. Malinus says, hey, have you read verse 5 in Revelation 4? You get flashes of lightning, peals of thunder. That's like sky stuff, okay, up there. So consequently, Malinus says, the sea of glass before the throne, and really under the throne, is likely to be understood as the firmament. Malinus would say, well, let's try that out. Let's just, you know, let's just put that one away and, and consider it. Third, Given that the cherubim imagery of Ezekiel 1, repurposed in Revelation 4, corresponds to the four points of the Babylonian zodiac, an astral significance to John's throne description and 24 elders seems to make sense. Now, you know, we talked about this uh, before as far as um, the Ezekiel 1 imagery. 
uh, we, we've spent some time before on the podcast in that material. And if you remember, I, I, I cited Dan Block, uh, his commentary on, on Ezekiel. The Ezekiel one, he makes this point, you know, you, the, the four faces of the cherubim are the four cardinal points of the Babylonian zodiac. And the theology is significant. You know, you have, you have the eyes and the wheels, okay? The wheel is a circuit. It goes around. Okay, and you've got eyes in the wheels, and depending on how you take chapter 10, verse 12, you could have the, the eyes in, you know, the, the, the creatures. You certainly have the eyes in the creatures in Revelation. And eyes in the creatures and the wheels, and they all have eyes. This is constellations, and constellations go around. They have cycles. And this is astronomical slash astrological imagery that Ezekiel is using in chapter 1 of his vision. This is what he sees. And what does it communicate? Okay, what what do constellations and stars and rotating cycles in the heavens do? They map time. And and why is that important? Because history proceeds through time. And the messaging is this all of this is controlled. The passage of time and history and human destiny is controlled by whoever sits on the throne in the midst of all this. And in Ezekiel's vision it's not a Babylonian deity like Marduk. It's Yahweh. So there they are, the exiles. Ezekiel has this vision. And the point of the vision is to say, you know, like, like preachers like to say, God is still on the throne. Yeah, we're kicked out of the land. You know, we, we're apostates. We violated the covenant. But God is still with us. He still has a plan. He is still in control. Now, I would suggest that John, knows that. He understands Ezekiel 1. He understands the astral imagery. He understands the theological teaching point, and he uses that material. Or, again, God providentially gives him the material by virtue of the vision. You know, it's probably you know, a little bit of both. To communicate the same idea. Revelation is what? It's an apocalypse. Bad stuff is coming down the road. It's the end of days. Who's in control of all that? Who's going to make sure that the righteous are vindicated? Who's going to make sure that the nations are judged? And of course, they're gods. Why, that would be Yahweh's counsel. Okay, God is still on the throne. He is still ruling with his counsel like he you know, did, frankly, in the book of Ezekiel, but also you know, all these other passages we've cited, Isaiah, Daniel 7. Again, it is God, think of Daniel 7, it is God who decides the flow of history and the destiny of empires, including his enemies. So I, I think John is trying to communicate the same things. Now let's go back a little more detail with the whole astral approach to Revelation 4. A little bit of ancient astronomy talk here. Egypt and Babylon, okay, they're, they're both going to factor in here because of some terminology and the way they understood things. So. What Malina does is he, he, you know, he makes these sort of observations, and I just you know, sort of create, create a, a paraphrase list you know, from his material. And, and again, he's suggesting, look, you've know, you got all this stuff to consider from an astral perspective. Maybe we, ought to, maybe we ought to do that. And he moves from the textual observations to arguing that the elders specifically were decans. That's D-E-C-A-N-S. Decans are groups of stars that ancient cultures used to mark out specific phases or portions of the night sky. To be more technical, decan comes from the Greek word deca, ten, and the word, quote, is a creation of the Hellenistic period to designate the astral deities who dominate over every ten degrees of the circle of the zodiac. That's Mal on the page 94. So, a decan is a portion of the sky, in, in this, in, by virtue of the terminology, of, you know, 10 degrees. Now, Egypt and Babylon had a decan system of 36. 36 times 10, 360 degrees is a circle. It makes good sense. So Egypt and Babylon had 36 decans dividing the sky into 36 sections of 10 degrees for their 360-degree system. The book of Revelation you know, is, a, is a product of a little bit of a later period, Hellenistic period. And the Hellenistic sort of approach to this differed from the older, you know, 36. Okay, it opted for the number 24. Malina writes this. He says, Herodotus records that, quote, 
the Greeks learned about the sundial and the gnomon. Again, this is time and measurement stuff. And the 12 fold division of the day from the Babylonians. So Babylon did use 12 you know, to, to chop up the day. Okay, so Herodotus records that the Greeks learned that from them. And he says, Malin, you know, continues, he says, by the 5th century BC, the civilized world from Babylon to Greece knew of 12 lunar months of 30 days. Then on the analogy of the year, the day, daylight plus nighttime, was divided into 12 larger, what they call double hours, and 360 smaller units. Does this sound familiar? We have a 24-hour day, and, you know, the, the 360 is 60, you know, divisible by 60, 60 minutes. Okay, so, you know, we inherit parts of this too, all right? So on analogy of the year, the day, daylight plus nighttime, was divided into 12 larger double hours and 360 smaller units. These time units were connected with the circular course of the sun, the moon, and the stars in terms of the same procedure. A circle circumference consisted of 12 equal double segments and 360 lesser units in the Hellenistic system. Thus, by the time of John's gospel, now pay attention to this, it's first century. By the time of John's gospel, it is no surprise when Jesus asks, theoretically, are there not 12 hours in the day? It's John 11, 9. It, it, it shows they're using this system. These 12 hours, Malina writes, corresponding to the 12 divisions of the celestial circle are in fact double hours, hence 24 in all. Consequently, our seer, John, of the Apocalypse, Book of Revelation, our seer could see 24 elders about the central throne of God. In a number of Israelite inscriptions from around the Mediterranean, a council of elders was called a gerousia or a decania, <laughs> while a member of this council was called presbutes or presbuteros, which is the term translated in Revelation 4 for elder. Presbutes, presbuteros, these were synonyms for the Latin decurio and the Greek decanos. There you go. So, you know, it's the end of the Malina quote. For Malina, the fact that the elders surrounded the throne of God, you know, was also visually significant. To him, it was an interpretive clue, along with all this other stuff. This description, Malina points out, and he's right, is unique in divine council scenes, where the members of the council typically stand either before the Lord, like Job 1, Job 1, 6, Job 2, 1, Daniel 7, 10 has that language. Or they stand to the left and the right. That's 1 Kings 22. Divine council members are, of course, the members of the heavenly host, the stars of God. Now, this unique encircling, now catch what Malin is angling for with the circle thing, surrounding the throne. This unique encircling of the celestial council members, therefore, refers to stars encircling the throne of God in the heavens. For Malina, this arrangement depicted the rotating cycle of the zodiac signs that encompassed the decans, which were the elders. Now, he goes on. Malina cites comments of classical writer Diodorus Siculus. It's 2.31.4, for those who want to look it up, whose writings date to just before the Christian era. So he, just, he cites Diodorus in favor of his approach. He says, Diodorus wrote, Beyond the circle of the zodiac, the Babylonians designate 24 other stars, of which one half, they say, there's your 12 and 12, are situated in the northern parts and one half in the southern. And of these, those which are visible, they assign, Babylonians assign to the world of the living, while those which are invisible, they regard as being adjacent to the dead. And so they call them judges of the universe. <laughs> so he said, look, the Babylonian 12 and 12 thing, you know, they, you know, to, they're collectively called the judges of the universe. Decastas ton halon. Now, the wording here, judges, pretty obviously, fits the context of Revelation 4 and 5, because this is the divine council scene that is convened to render justice in the last days. Now, again, you, you could get Mal in this book if you want more of this kind of stuff, but you know, th that's really fascinating. Okay, it, it's, it's really fascinating. And I think it's worth consideration and worth looping into this whole question of who are the 24 elders. Are they supernatural beings? Are they glorified righteous? 
Are they the stars? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think all of these things are in play. It's really difficult to imagine that all of this, this stuff, all of these data, we'll just, just take what we just went through with Malin. It's really hard to imagine that it's all coincidental or irrelevant to John's description in Revelation 4 and 5. You know, in light of the use of astral language and metaphor for the divine counsel in biblical thought generally, particularly in light of Ezekiel's vision and its zodiacal correspondence, which John uses quite a bit. We got the cherubim right in here. You know, that was the last episode of the podcast. We talked about the cherubim. I mean, it's right there. You know, in, in light of astral language, metaphor, Ezekiel's vision, it seems best to include to include the astral approach alongside the motifs that identify the elders with both supernatural members of the council and glorified believers in the council. In other words, I don't see an obvious need to pick one of these three possibilities. You know, the Old Testament council language employs astral terminology, suggests a glorified destiny for believers in that council. The New Testament solidifies the latter concept. A passage like Daniel 12.3, in fact, merges the ideas, again, in its foreshadowing. Quote, those who are wise shall sign like the brightness of the sky above and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. By the way, that's day and night right there. Brightness of the sky above and like the stars forever and ever. 12 and 12. Okay, the grand idea is that God and his counsel control the flow of history and destiny. And these images communicate that truth. And John's doing the same thing Ezekiel's trying to do. It's going to get bad on earth. This is an apocalypse. This is the end of days. Who is in control? Is our, is our destiny, is your destiny as a believer secure when basically the whole thing explodes? And the answer is, yeah. Yeah, it is. In fact, in fact, on the other side of it, you're going to emerge as glorified children and co-rulers with God. And again, he's trying to communicate these ideas using all of this imagery. So I think, what, who are the 24 elders? What are they? I think it's all three. I think all three are in play. All right, Mike, part three, just like that. Uh, it's amazing how much like is that. packed into Revelation 4. I three know. hours of I know. Old Testament good stuff. I love it. Yep. Thank you, John. <laughs> 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 it's well, messy, but thank you. We said this is yeah. going to be a, a a long process, but uh, I know we've talked about this before about how seminary students aren't really being taught to connect those dots from the Old Testament to the New Testament. But uh, hopefully, yeah, we're changing minds here. Yeah, and I, I think I think it's generally, you know, not, and I'm, I'm not going to say that this podcast is responsible because it, you know, it's not, although we're, we're playing a role, especially in people who are not enrolled in seminary classes. And I, and honestly, I think we are ahead in, in a lot of respects, but I do think it's changing. People are paying, you know, professors and of course their students, you know, they, whether they like it or not, are paying more attention, you know, to seeing how the old Testament is repurposed in the new seeing how Second Temple literature, again, produced by people who revered the Old Testament as the Word of God and wrote about it, how that material was helpful and influential and meaningful to New Testament writers. And, you know, we, the more aware we are of it, the better readers we will be. All right. We're looking forward to Chapter 5 next week. And uh, with that, Mike, yeah. I want to thank everybody for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. God bless Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com. You're listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, go to nakedbiblepodcast.com and click on the support link in the upper right-hand corner. If you're new to the podcast and Dr. Heiser's approach to the Bible, click on New Start Here at nakedbiblepodcast.com.
Welcome to the Naked Bible Podcast, episode 369, Revelation 5. I'm the layman, Trey Strickland, and he's the scholar, Dr. Michael Heiser. Hey, Mike, what's going on? Well, not much. Kind of settled into a routine now, which is nice. Yeah, that's good. So the routine we like, means... We like routine, you know? Yeah. Well, and, although I, sh- I should mention, my, my daughter got a... They got a puppy, because they're, they're going to be moving out in another month, so they got a, a puppy, and... You know, there's nothing better than a puppy except maybe two puppies. But this is a, it's a little shelty. And of course, it manages to fall in the pool. <laughs> you know, but the thing is, like, it fell in and it just immediately swam well, like across the pool over to my daughter. And I'm thinking, like, what's up with the pugs? You know, <laughs> it just like, why can't they do that? Or That's so. Funny. You know, we're still we're still doing the floaty thing when when it gets warmer when we put them in intentionally because they That's they either need to learn or confirm our suspicions. Yeah. Well, have you not gotten in there with them yet to give them some lessons? No, it's it's just not warm enough. It's not warm you know? enough. Yeah. Well. So it, I mean, we hit we had we were in the sixties a couple of days this week, yeah. so it, it's getting there. Yeah. Well, well, it's a good thing we talked pre-show, Mike, because we could have done thirty minutes on talking about. Uh, your fantasy baseball draft coming up and uh, pro wrestling. Turns out me and Mike are both fans <laughs> right. of wrestling back in the 70s, 80s, and you know, all yeah. in the mid the 90s and 2000s. Huh. Yeah, well, uh, yeah, so, I, w- I, w- I was done in the 80s, the early yeah. 80s. You know? I started fading so, out in the 90s, but uh, when I when I became a man, I put away childish things, you know. That. Uh, well, uh, well, I <laughs> but put down no, some, no, I, but not I, all. I was into it in junior high, you know, oh. junior high a little bit in high school. So that, yeah, that brought back good memories actually. Uh, yeah. The audience is stuff. already grateful. Yeah. <laughs> it's good stuff though. I mean, we went deep into it. So it was good. Yep. Back it's in fun. the day, back in the day who our favorites were and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah That's what I tell my kids, you know, because I, I have these conversations about, you know, they're, they're 20 or whatever, you know, it's oh, what am I going to do with my life? You know, I'm, I'm behind so-and-so or, you know, I got to, you know, I lost a year moving and blah, blah, blah. You know what? Like I'm doomed or something. It's like, look, when I was your age, I was watching the Three Stooges and wrestling. So you're going to be OK. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's really not a crisis. Yeah. Mm, not me, Mike. I was already in the corporate world. I was on the airplane yeah. four times a week. Pre 9-11, it was such a joy uh, to travel because you could just. I lived in Dallas at the time. And Mike, I lived about mm, 40 minutes from the airport. I woke up late okay. at the time and 30 minutes before my flight. And I had like the 6.30 in the morning flight. So traffic, no traffic, anything, still dark. Yeah. I told my cab driver, if you can get me there in 20 minutes, I'll give you $100. He got me there. I made my flight. So I literally, 45, <laughs> 40 minutes away from the DFW airport, I woke up. In 20 minutes. 30, I woke up within 30 minutes of my flight and I still made it. You could not do that. After That's that unbelievable. Yeah, no, yeah, you can't do that now. No, not at all. I'm really paranoid about flying, so I'm the guy that that has to be there two hours ahead. Oh. I had, I sort of, I'm, I'm still traumatized by an experience I had in the Paris airport, it's an international society of biblical liter- literature meeting. I decided to take my daughter and and a niece, and it just, gosh, it was bad. Yeah, I thought we were going to miss flights in, in Paris. And it's like nobody speaks French and what, and they, and they hate the Americans anyway. And, you know, all this, all this stuff flowing through my head, you know, and it was, it was traumatic yeah. trying to get through that airport fast. And I thought never again. Yeah. Okay. We are going to be anywhere two hours early. So I get made fun of now, but it's like, look, you can relax now. Yeah. I'm usually the last one on the plane because the less I have to sit on the plane, more comfortable I am. I'm just too big. To yeah. Sit in those things for extended periods of time. All right. Well, switching gears now, I know we've been talking about uh, Revelation 5 over the last three episodes, but now we really are <laughs> Revelation 5. Yeah. Yeah. And for those who might just be tuning into this one, we have, I've mentioned Revelation 4 and 5 in the last three episodes because the chapters do go together. But the the episodes have really been only about Revelation four. But this one, uh, you know, the fourth in a series technically. This one is going to be about just Revelation five. So, 
Uh, don't get disoriented uh, by the references to Revelation 5 in this one. And you think, well, you know, it was 4 and 5 up until this point. What, what's this chapter 5 doing? That, that's why. So, you know, the two chapters go together. Three prior episodes really zeroed in on Revelation 4. And now we're going to mop up with chapter 5. So let's let's get started. You know, on the this is probably again Revelation four is pretty familiar, but I was going to say that this one might even be even more familiar to the average Christian. Again, reading through Revelation or hearing preaching about it, especially I mean, because this this is the chapter that has the uh, the Lamb again, the appearance of the Lamb of God standing before the throne, and you know, I think maybe for good reasons and maybe some contrived reasons, this makes good preaching. So people dip into revelation and, you know, this, this tends to be one of the chapters, you know, this one and this, the second coming and maybe, you know, the, 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 you know, lake of fire or something like that. You know, people tend to cherry pick revelation. This is going to be one of the more familiar passages. And on the surface, you know, it, it seems pretty transparent as far as what's going on here. So, it's not that long. I'm going to read the whole thing. And I think right away you're going to notice maybe some familiar things. Or if you're really paying attention, you might be be jarred a little bit by what you expect to hear in the passage, but actually isn't there. So I'm going to read it first, and then we'll jump back into, you know, kind of doing a little bit of a backdrop to the chapter. But John writes, Then I saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals? And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain. And by your blood, you ransomed people, people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard around the throne, and heard around the throne, and the living creatures and the elders, the voice of many angels, numbering myriads of of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshiped. Now, the assumption, again, just the average assumption, if you got into a conversation about Revelation 5 and you, you ran into somebody that actually you know remembered parts of it, many people presume it is some sort of enthronement scene or ceremony. The one seated on the throne, God, has a scroll in his right hand sealed with seven seals, and only the Lamb of God standing before the throne who is risen. He is the risen Messiah, the Lion of Judah, the Root of David. Only he is worthy to open the seals. But if we look closely, we see incongruities with that assumption, this idea that it's about the enthronement of the Lamb. It's actually not. The lamb never occupies the throne, nor is he later in the book seated on the throne as the seals are opened. In fact, only after everything plays out in the apocalypse, you know, in the book of Revelation, only then do we have a hint that the lamb is also enthroned. And that's Revelation 22, verse 1. Let me just read it to you. Revelation 22, 1 says, Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So there you have this shared throne idea. But that's it. I mean, that's the end of the book. The Lamb does not occupy the throne in Revelation 5. 
or anywhere until you hit the end of the book. So that's, you know, one sort of oddity. Further, the authority given to the Lamb is dispensed by him, by the Lamb, to believers. This is Revelation 5, 9, and 10. You, you may have caught it while, as I was reading. So the four living creatures, 24 elders, fell down before the Lamb, and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll. Again, they're really speaking, you know, singing to the Lamb. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them, these ransom people, a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. So he even hands off or, or, or shares the authority that, that, that's given to him. So we're, we're therefore confronted with some unexpected elements if we assume outright that Revelation 5 is about the Lamb's enthronement, because that never happens. So these incongruities have led scholars in different directions, you know, as they read the text closely. And uh, on in his Revelation commentary, still in the first volume, that's chapters one through five, he writes this, and he sort of sketches the options. Revelation five is often interpreted as depicting the enthronement of the Lamb based on the assumption that the text reflects the pattern of ancient enthronement ritual. Others have argued that Revelation five is modeled after the tradition of a commission in the heavenly court or council, sometimes combining the two patterns. The view argued in this commentary, this is Owen's take, is that it is more appropriate to understand Revelation 5 as depicting the investiture of the Lamb based not on ancient enthronement customs and procedures, but rather on the literary adaptation of Daniel 7 and Ezekiel 1 and 2. So right away you ask, well, what's the difference? You know, what's the difference between enthronement or commission, you know, when you hear commission, think like Isaiah 6. You know, there's Isaiah in the divine council, you know, room, the throne room, and said, you know, you know, here am I, send me, and then they commission him, and so on and so forth. So that's what that's talking about. So what's the difference between enthronement, commission, and Owen's word, investiture? So in most basic terms, enthronement speaks of the coronation of a new ruler. Commission is a term associated with the appointment to a task, and investiture describes the establishment of someone in an office that that person already holds informally. The terms are therefore synonyms whose meanings have points of overlap, but they also retain some nuancing that distinguishes them. So what leads scholars to opt for one choice over another? Again, this is all backdrop to Revelation 5 and we're going to incorporate it into what we've talked about before with Revelation 4 and the Divine Council setting and all that. Well, those who opt for enthronement, again, still, even though the Lamb never occupies the throne, you're still going to have people that, that are in this category. Those who opt for enthronement will point to the earlier instance in Revelation 3.21, where the exalted Jesus, who is obviously the Lamb, speaks of having already conquered and taking his seat with God on the ruling throne. Okay, we've referenced that verse a lot in earlier episodes. They might also appeal to Revelation 7:17, 7, where the lamb, and this is, I think, pretty ambiguous, but the, the lamb is said to be in the midst of the throne. So that, that's going to get interpreted as he's on the throne or something. Well, it doesn't actually say on the throne. He says in the midst of the throne. But anyway, that, that would be part of the appeal. The threefold process of Israelite coronation or kingmaking is also a factor. And this is something we've covered in a previous podcast uh, when we talked about um, the Old Testament. I believe this is the one, the Old Testament Luke, but I'm not quite sure. But anyway, how the Gospels present Jesus as king. Well, I think, you know, well, let me, let me just go on because I'll give you the source for that. If you remember that episode, there were three factors of, of how an Israelite man became king. First, there was the designation of the candidate for kingship. And that's usually something d done to that candidate to make him a candidate, like anointing. That, that's typically the procedure, anointing. Not always, but most of the time. Second, the designated candidate has to prove himself kingly by doing some heroic act. And third, the successful candidate is exalted to the throne. Now, as Shelton has thrown, this is an article I, I use in that earlier episode. 
as Shelton has thrown, all three of these steps play out in the life of Jesus in the Gospels. Consequently, enthronement seems to make sense. However, the incongruities mentioned above mar the picture. Well, you know, if if Jesus is already enthroned, like like what does that mean? Because the Lamb is not on the throne in Revelation five, and and there's no clear reference to him being on the throne until Revelation twenty two. So what what about what happens in the Gospels? What about Revelation three? You know, I, I, I'm. You know, I've I've conquered. I'm sitting on the throne of my father, and then you know, to him that overcomes, I will I will let him also sit on the seat. You know, and all this stuff. How do we, how do we, put all this together you know, so that it makes sense? Because it seems inconsistent. Other scholars view Revelation five again, as I mentioned, through the lens of other divine council scenes, where a spirit, that's First Kings twenty two, or a prophet, Isaiah six is commissioned for a specific task. The problem with that approach here is fundamentally twofold. Number one, the task of the Lamb is already accomplished. He doesn't need to be appointed to a task. He's already done the task. He has been faithful unto death and is now raised to new life. He's standing here. So you have a Lamb that looks like it was slain, but it's standing up. Again, it's it's a resurrection picture. And secondly, the divine council in Revelation 5 is clearly meeting to dispense judgment, not hand out an assignment. So the commission view doesn't really work, and, and frankly, it doesn't have many adherents. Still others, like On, see the best option as their term or his term, investiture. So this approach views the incongruities of enthronement in Revelation 5 through the lens of the already accomplished kingly accession in the gospel. So investiture is actually going to be one of these already but not yet approaches, which, which to me makes more sense. The crucifixion the resurrection and the ascension are acknowledged as the actual transition to rulership of Jesus. So Jesus has gone through the three-step process uh, of of, of kingship, okay? So the the investiture view acknowledges that Jesus is, you know, he, he is the ruler, while simultaneously acknowledging that the ultimate goal of God is not yet accomplished, and that is the reconciliation of the entire cosmos to himself and the restoration of Eden in consummated form. That isn't, that hasn't happened yet. And and when that happens, you're going to need a king and that king is going to be Jesus. But, but that's the not yet. We have the already, but the not yet. Now that final form happens in Revelation 22, where the lamb is described as enthroned, Revelation 22 one. So consequently, scholars like On opt for understanding Revelation 5 as investiture, not enthronement. It is the formal transition or display to all the world of what has informally been the case for quite some time, you know, when Jesus rose from the dead and ascended. Investiture thus views enthronement as an already not yet point, and this in turn doesn't impose a new commissioning on the Lamb, okay, so we don't have the commission problem, and retains the progression of the apocalypse to the end of all things when Eden is restored and God, the Lamb, and the children of God are partnered in rule of that new global Eden. So On goes on to describe the idea this way. He says, The argument that Revelation 5 should be construed as the investiture of the Lamb is based on an analysis of the text of Revelation 5 as an adaptation of Daniel 7 and Ezekiel 1 and 2. The narrative in Revelation 5 centers on the recognition of the Lamb as the only one worthy to open the scroll sealed with seven seals. The investiture scene in Revelation 5 appears to have been adapted from Daniel 7, 9 through 14. Let me just stop there. Remember earlier when we talked about Revelation 4, we made the point in the the first episode when we jumped into that chapter that there's like 14 points of Daniel 7 that Revelation 4 follows in the same order. Okay, so it's very obvious that John is tracking on Daniel 7. So back to on. So the investiture scene in Revelation 5 appears to have been adapted from Daniel 7, 9 through 14, which centers on the investiture of, quote, one like a son of man, unquote, and not his enthronement. Even though enthronement is not mentioned in Daniel 7, let me stop there. Did you realize that? I mean, in Daniel 7, the son of man is given everlasting kingship, but but he never sits down. He's never enthroned. (laughs) So it's this Yes, he has the authority, but but he hasn't yet been installed, okay, you know, over the kingdom. And, and, and the kingdom, I'm saying it that way to, to point to this 
not yet idea of, of when the whole thing is complete, when God gets what he wants, when we have a new Eden, all this stuff, that, that's the not yet part, which Owen and others are going to argue, this is why the, the Lamb doesn't, isn't described as being on a throne until you hit Revelation 22, 1. But anyway, back to Owen. He says, even though enthronement is not mentioned in Daniel 7, however, scholars frequently assume that it is suggested or implied. The author has applied the language of Daniel 7, 14, and 18 to the redemptive death of Christ, which has enthroned, quote-unquote, Christians as kings and priests. The author has overlaid the existing kingship language in Daniel 7, 14, and 18 with the kingdom and priest language from Exodus 19, 6, which he also used earlier in Revelation, in Revelation 1, 7. And he's going to use it later in Revelation 20, verse 6. So the author of Revelation 4 and 5 has taken the basic framework of Daniel 7, 9 through 18, and freely adapted it for a new purpose, the presentation of the one like a son of man before the enthroned ancient of days in Daniel 7, 13, results in his investiture. John has grounded that investiture on the sacrificial death of Christ, which now becomes the very basis for investiture. The motif of the sealed scroll does not occur in Daniel 7. There is only the reference to the books being opened in Revelation 2012 also. But again, this sealed scroll idea, it's imported from Ezekiel 2, 9 and 10 to serve as a symbol of investiture. Let me just reference Ezekiel 2, 9 and 10 because that's less familiar than Daniel 7. Behold, again, Ezekiel describing what he sees here. Behold, when I look, behold, a hand was stretched out to me and behold, a scroll of a book was in it. And he spread it out before me, and it had writing on the front and on the back, and there was written on it words of lamentation and mourning and woe. So the description of the scroll here is the same that you see in Revelation, uh, Revelation 5 here with John. That's Owen's point. So John is using that description of the scroll, which is going to have something to do with, you know, the the, the doom of of Judah in, in Ezekiel. And he's repurposing it here in an apocalyptic scene that's going to unfold in, in judgment, not, not on Judah this time, but on, on the whole earth. Okay. Wicked Jew and wicked Gentile, you know, unbelieving Jew, unbelieving Gentile, you know, the, the whole thing. So John is adapting that image of the scroll and he's also, you know, ad- adapting the scene from Daniel 7, 9 through 14 to, you know, and think about what, he, what he's already done in Revelation with the son of man imagery and the Ancient of Days, I mean, he fuses those two things together to identify Jesus with God or as God, okay, that, that much is clear. But again, even in Daniel 7, the Son of Man is not on the throne yet. He does inherit, you know, rulership. He is the legitimate rightful ruler, and God is giving him this authority. And so the argument is that God gave Jesus this authority when he rose from the dead and ascended to the Father. This is long before Revelation 5 was, was experienced by John and written down. And, and in that scene, it's a hearkening back to the death and resurrection of the Lamb, of Christ. That's what gave him his authority. And that's what gives the Son of Man his authority. But he's not yet seated. The job is not yet complete in terms of everything coming full circle to a new Eden, God returning to earth among his people, so on and so forth. So it's an already but not yet idea that we're seeing here again. I mean, this is a familiar theme in Scripture, already but not yet. It happens all over the place in different areas of theology. So On draws attention to the fact that the Son of Man in Daniel 7, of course, is not enthroned in the passage, even though it's clear that he has everlasting kingship and dominion. But again, this is not his rule alone. By his own choice, the kingdom is shared with or given to the holy ones in Daniel 7 and the people of the holy ones. Isn't that interesting? Because, you know, most commentators are going to say, oh, holy ones, people of the holy ones. It, it refers to the same thing. It refers to, to human followers of, of God, okay, of, of the Son of Man or whatever. And I, I don't agree with that. I'm, I'm with those scholars that say these are actual different categories. One is a reference to the holy ones of the divine council, the heavenly host that is loyal to God. And the other one are, are human believers. And they are, they are together. They are fused together. They're given the same authority. Okay, they are, they, the two become one. All right, just so we've talked before when we had the, the Cloud of Witnesses episode and you know, other things. And you know, Unseen Realm, of course, I talk about this, how believers are going to be the reconstituted council. We are going to replace that which has been lost through rebellion. 
in the council. I mean, Daniel 7 gives you a glimpse of that. And so does Revelation 5, because the, the authority is given over to, again, those glorified believers that are you know, sort of in the scene uh, as, as a kingdom of priests. And I, I, th- I think they're focused on because the rulership is going to be on earth, okay, that this new Eden idea, new, the new you know, glorified global Eden. So again, Revelation 5, 9 through 10 is the, is the passage that makes this point when the 24 elders sing that you, you know, the Lamb has made all these ransom people from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them kingdom and priests to our God. And by the way, you know, there you go again with this one body, one man. Okay, the, the, the Jew and the Gentile are not distinguished here. There's one kingdom of priests. And it's from, to quote John, every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. And again, this is by design, because if you go back to Daniel 7, go back to Daniel 7, again, let's just go there real quickly. Not like a new, new idea, a new invention here. If you go back to Daniel 7, 18, let's just pick up with 18. The saints of the Most High, the Holy Ones of the Most High, shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever. Then you get to 24, uh, actually 27 here. Let's go back to verse 26. The court shall sit in judgment. His dominion, you know, the, the beast, will be taken away to be consumed and destroyed to the end. And the kingdom and the dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms, plural, kingdoms, plural, under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints, people of the holy ones of the most high. And his kingdom shall be an everlasting kingdom and his dominions, plural, shall serve and obey him. So, I mean, you, you, you get this notion, again, that the kingdom is bigger than just Israel, right? It, it's, it's the whole earth. You go back up to 14, Daniel 7, 14, to him, the Son of Man was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. Okay, so what John is saying is, is he's taken that passage and he's equating that language with the redeemed, okay, the redeemed from every tribe, language, nation, so on and so forth. This is how John views the the outcome of Daniel seven, and it's important again because we you know we have to recognize the 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 unity of of the people of God. Uh, it's not just you know Israel; it, it's everybody. This is by design. This is the original intention because Eden which is what we're going back to. This is the way the book of Revelation ends with the global you know, Eden. Eden didn't have these distinctions. We didn't have Jews and Gentiles in Eden. We were just people, okay, human believers, so on and so forth. So again, by way of summary, you know, let, let's just think about what we have in the, in the first five chapters. So let, let's just expand this a little bit, uh, this theme. What do we have in Revelation 1.5? Well, we have the lamb who was slain now stands before the throne of God. Okay, that he's resurrected. That's chapter five. The Lamb is Jesus, who is depicted in Revelation one as the Ancient of Days and Son of Man from Daniel seven, who was described earlier in Revelation one, who was dead but is now alive. Revelation three twenty one looks forward to both Revelation five and Revelation twenty two. So it, it's not that that the you know Jesus has been installed as king. You know, in Revelation three twenty one, basically it's to, to the one who overcomes. This is this is what's going to happen. This is your destiny. I will, okay. I will at some point. You know, when when I'm enthroned, I, I will grant to that person to sit with me on my throne and rule the nations and so on and so forth. So, Revelation five again is is the to use Owen's term the investiture of that. It it is sort of rolling into. Not reality, because I mean, Jesus is a real ruler, but it's it. Revelation is is designed to sort of start the wheels grinding toward the end. It's a description of okay, God is acting now. The end of days is approaching. The wheels are set in motion, and we have here again the transition in the Book of Revelation. The Book of Revelation is is supposed to transition our thinking from the already to the not yet. Okay, this is the progression. It's going to progress from already to not yet. And this is how things are going to play out. We see the the present and the future going on in, in the book. So 
this is this is why scholars can say Revelation three twenty one is is looking forward to Revelation five, and then that's looking forward to Revelation twenty two. It's just a progression. It's not you know moment in time observation that that that's you know already complete. It's, it's not complete. It's partial. It's already but not yet. So in some way, you know, the, the Lamb's rulership, Jesus' rulership, is a reality, though the Lamb is not pictured yet as being enthroned until the end. Again, and, and the enthronement there is, is we're done now. I can sit down, okay, and to borrow Sabbath terminology, and rest, <laughs> okay? You know, I, when, the, when the king sits, the job is complete. Kings don't really sit around on, the, on their behinds, you know, while there's work to be done here. But when the king is enthroned at the end, in Revelation 22, then the job is over and, and things have come full circle. So despite yet not yet being enthroned, the lamb alone has the status of being worthy to open the scroll that will unleash the apocalypse and start to propel things toward the consummation of his rule. With God as his father and with those who, whose believing loyalty remain true, they're, they're, it's, it's all one picture. In short, through Jesus' faithfulness to his mission, he has already achieved the means by which God will ultimately get what he's always wanted, to have a human family with whom to share rule of the earth. So that's, again, an overall perspective of what's going on in Revelation 5. I want to drill down on a few things, though, that have specific referent uh, to certain parts of the Old Testament for the rest of the episode. So let's just go back and, and start at the beginning. Revelation 5, 1 and 2, we have a reference to a scroll written within and on the back, sealed with seven seals. Okay, a Beal and McDonough. This is in the Beal and Carson uh, big commentary on the use of the Old Testament and the New. Beal and McDonough write uh, the, the Revelation portion of that, and they, they write this. They say most interpreters have rightly identified the phrase of 5.1b, quote, a scroll or book written on the front and back, unquote, as evoking the image of Ezekiel 2, 9, and 10. John's scroll, like Ezekiel's, will contain lamentations, mourning, and woe. That was the description in Ezekiel 2.10. Well, you, again, you better believe that this is what you're going to see in Revelation because it's an apocalypse. You know, back to the quote, the biblion, that's the Greek word translated book, is further described by the phrase having been sealed with seven seals, which appears to be a merging of Daniel 12, 1, 4, and 9 with Isaiah 29, 11. Let me just look those up just so that you have those fixed in your head. So Daniel 12, you get some of this terminology. At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who has charge of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble, such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. Verse 4, Daniel, shut up the words and seal the book until the time of the end. Verse 6, I think, was it verse 6 or verse 9? Go back here and look quick. Uh, verse 9 says, he said, go your way, Daniel, for the words are shut up and sealed until the time of the end. So you have a reference to a book that's sealed, again, so on and so forth. So Beale and McDonough are saying, you know, John is, you know, looks like he's borrowing some of this language from Daniel, you know, again, because Daniel is about a lot of the same stuff. So this is the, the other side of the coin, the book of Revelation. Isaiah 29, 11 is going to be far less familiar. The vision of all this has become to you like words of a book that is sealed when men give it to one who can read, saying, read this, he says, I can't, for it is sealed. And that, you know, gives you a certain feel that, that Beale and McDonough and some others that we'll look at uh, are going to, you know, play off on. Uh, back to the quote, they say, the phrase, to loose the seals in 5.2, reveals more inspiration from the sealing of Daniel 12 and 29, Isaiah 29. The idea of sealing, here's the point, and opening books in connection with end time happenings is unique in the Old Testament to Daniel 12, 1 through 13, specifically as it's related to times of the end. That, that's Daniel 12. Daniel 12, 8, and 9 implies the future unsealing of the book in the latter day period. This is yet another indication that John's prophecy contains the fulfillment of the latter day prophecies of Daniel. Okay, so John is, you know, John's book of Revelation is going to be the fulfillment of these things. Beale adds in another place, in another book, he adds some other thoughts about the passage. He writes, It should be recalled that Revelation 4, 1 through 5, 1 follows a structural outline that is identical to that of Daniel 7, 9, you know, and following. 
and Ezekiel 1 and 2. The following analysis of Revelation 5, 2 through 14, again, this is his commentary, will show that the outline of Daniel 7 continues to be followed. Okay, instead of Ezekiel 1 and 2. So he said, John is, we're in Daniel 7, John's going to you know, keep tracking through here, and, that, and now he's going to repurpose some stuff in Daniel 12, so on and so forth. So he wants to, to just make the point that John is really fixed on Daniel in, in these chapters. Okay, while allusions to Ezekiel 1 and 2 do not disappear in Revelation 5, 2 through 14, there are more numerous allusions to Daniel 7. The presence of all these Old Testament backgrounds enhances further the notion of judgment with which this vision is saturated. So that's the end of Beale's quote. Now, what about the description? You know, we can presume the scroll is rolled up. That's typically how we would think about this. Though the word is biblion. Now, the, the, the technical term for, for this idea of a, a biblion, a, a, a document, okay, rolled up is opistograph. An opistograph is, is a rolled document. Well, it's not always a rolled document, but most of the time it's a rolled document. It's written on both sides. A codex is possible. Remember, a codex is when you know somebody got the idea instead of using scrolls, we're going to cut you know a scroll or the, the material for a scroll in squares. We can write on both sides, and then we're going to bind the edge. You know, we create a book codex. Okay, that that's possible as as that form of written material came into use in the late first century. Yeah, that's that's what on postulates anyway. So he's he's saying, well, maybe it's not, maybe the biblion isn't a scroll, maybe it's a codex, you know, because you can still write on both sides, and these would have come into use probably around when when Revelation is written. Again, a scroll is considered more likely though by most scholars, perhaps because of iconography. I mean, if you look at Greco-Roman iconography of rulers from John's period, they often are holding scrolls; they're not holding codices. Okay. They're holding scrolls in their hand, and often it's the right hand, just like it is, you know, here in, in, um, you know, Revelation, Revelation five. So on, you know, he reject or he reflects the majority opinion that it's a scroll. He says there are two major arguments for regarding the Biblion as an opistograph, again a scroll written on both sides. One, the allusion to Ezekiel two nine and ten that certainly predates the Codex, and that's where the description is taken from. So again, it's probably a scroll. And two, the original reading on the inside and on the back, in other words, on the obverse and reverse, which is appropriate for describing a closed or rolled up opistograph, a scroll. So again, there's no reason to depart from you know, the, the, the typical understanding here. But I thought you might find it interesting that some, some people want to still argue for a codex, but it, it's more likely a scroll. And I agree because of the allusion to Ezekiel 2, that, that pretty much seals it for me, pardon the pun. Some scholars have wondered whether the language might point to something else, though. There's a third option, something called, you know, the scholars call a double written document, and Owen describes this option. The basic rationale for a doubly written document is to provide a sealed document that, excuse me, that cannot be altered with an unsealed copy that can be read. It is written within, quote unquote, and without, quote unquote, in the sense that it consists of two copies of a legal document, one sealed, that's the one within, and one unsealed, that's the one, quote-unquote, without. The earliest evidence for doubly written document is Old Testament. It's Jeremiah 32, 9 to 15 actually describes this. That describes a sealed deed and an open or unsealed deed, both of which are placed in a clay jar. The procedure was to write two copies of the same legal document separated by a short space. The upper document was rolled together and sealed, while the lower document was simply folded together but could be read, you know, publicly. Again, it's kind of interesting, but most people don't find it persuasive, again, because of Ezekiel 2 and, and all that sort of stuff. You know, it doesn't seem to be the right trajectory since the seals are, are broken. You know, I mean, as, as, the, as Revelation continues, the seals get broken, so it kind of mars the, the double written document idea. But again... As, as a passing point, it's kind of interesting. You know, On doesn't consider it compelling. I don't either. And I, I think we're better off with a rolled scroll. Now, if it is a rolled scroll, it would look cylinder shaped. We can surmise that the, you know, written within and on the back description means that John can see the exterior script, but not the interior. He can see little, little, you know, maybe a few lines or a little portion of it. So he knows it's written, but he can't see what's inside because it's rolled and sealed. 
that the scroll is in the right hand of God implies its authority due to the right hand motif in the Old Testament that signifies power and authority. Exodus 15.6, Exodus 15.12, a bunch of of, references here. But again, just just the fact of, of how it's presented conveys the idea that whatever's in that scroll is authoritative. In other words, it's not going to change. <laughs> you know, this is the world's destiny right here, okay? It, it ain't going to change. It has the authority of God because he's the one holding it. The content of the scroll is obviously of interest. Again, here's another thing that, that you think you, you know, but you really don't. But the content is never actually revealed in the book of Revelation. We're never actually told what's in it. There's no specific reason to assume that Revelation 6 through 8 is a transcript of the scroll. I mean, there's no reason to believe that. It's never presented that way. You know, On writes this. He says, although there's been a great deal of speculation about the contents of the sealed scroll, the text of Revelation 5 through 8, which is the section dealing explicitly, explicitly with the sealed scroll and the breaking of the seven seals by the Lamb, that section contains no explicit indication of the contents of the scroll. If the scroll of Revelation 5 is regarded as identical with the open scroll of Revelation 10, which On doesn't consider likely, but again, think, think back to that double written document thing. But, you know, again, most scholars just think, nah, that, that's not what's going on here because the seals are broken, you know, in chapters 5 through 8. Whereas the double written document, that's not, that's not what you would do with it. But anyway, just something to think about. But he says, if, if, if the scroll of Revelation 5 is regarded as identical with the open scroll of Revelation 10, which isn't likely, more clues to its character are found in that chapter. An important clue for the contents of the scroll is, though, found in Ezekiel 2, 9, and 10, which is the model for this passage, in which the contents of the scroll shown to Ezekiel are described as, quote, words of mourning, lamentation, and woe, unquote. In other words, it's the message of divine judgment that the prophet will announce. But again, that doesn't give us specifics. It gives us the general character. So there's actually a wide range of options in scholarship as to the content of the scroll. I mean, because it's not explicitly spelled out, people have speculated lots of things. Is the content of the scroll initiated by the breaking of the first seal? Revelation 6.1, allowing us to surmise that the series of seals gives us the content. Or is the content of the scroll only actually revealed when all the seals are broken? And then that's the point. When the last seal is broken, that's the point when the scroll is actually open. You, you see the difference there. You know, people, again, assume, if, if they're assuming that Revelation 6 through 8 is the contents of the scroll, well, as each, as each put, think of this in your mind. Think of a, of a rolled document. It's got seven seals on it. We tend to think that when the first seal is broken, that, oh, well, they're reading, you know, what, what happens now is, is what's in the scroll. But it can't be because it's still sealed. Six times. I mean, think about that. This is another thing we assume <laughs> that if you actually, like if you actually acted it out, you know, here's a, here's, here's a rolled, you know, document where it's sealed seven times. Go ahead and break one. Okay, it's broken. Now read it. Well, I can't because it's still got six on it. Well, exactly. So Revelation 6 through 8 can't be the content of the scroll. That's the whole point. So the question is, well, when you get to the end, when the last seal is broken, is are we getting the content now? Again, we're never told. The heavenly books motif also, you know, is, is another speculation. Does that have anything to do with, with what's in the scroll? Okay, now we've done a whole episode on, on heavenly books, and I've referenced it a number of times in podcast episodes. It's episode 89. Again, there, there's whole monographs, scholarly books, you know, scholarly discussions in book form talking about the heavenly books of, of you know, both Old and New Testament and ancient literature. So some have speculated that, okay, got a scroll here. And is that scroll possibly the book of life? Because that's also mentioned too. Hmm. You know, when the, when the last seal's broken, where does that put us in the book? You know, is it a precursor to opening this and finding out who's in the book of life and who isn't? Yeah, it, it's an interesting idea, but we're never told. So, I mean, these are just some options that, that scholars discuss, you know, like, well, can we actually read it after one or two or five? No, no, you can't. You got to wait to the seven. Well, then what about what, what are the contents of Revelation six to eight? I mean, that can't correspond to the scroll. So what's going on? There's lots of questions here that, that the book of Revelation never actually answers for us. And, and these questions derive from both the nature of the, of the object held 
and also, again, this reference to heavenly books in the book elsewhere and even up to this point. But again, we're just not told. The best we've got is Ezekiel 2. Whatever's in the scroll is going to be bad, <laughs> which isn't terribly satisfying, but woe and lamentation and judgment. Yeah, we get it. We're, you know, as we read the book, you know, it's, it's pretty evident that's what's, what's happening here, but that's about the best you can do for specifics. So returning again to, to that whole theme, Ezekiel 2, 2, 9, and 10, the scroll is described as the words of mourning, lamentation, and woe. That description doesn't specifically target Judah or the Gentile nations. I'm talking about Ezekiel now. If, if this is the model, if John is repurposing Ezekiel 2, 9, and 10, and he wants his readers, when they hear the description or, or read the description of the scroll, they're going, oh, yeah, it's Ezekiel 2. Yeah, it's, 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 it's the same description. If you go back and look at Ezekiel 2, and we got, oh, man, words of warning and lamentation and woe. But guess what? That doesn't specifically target any one group, Judah or Gentile nations, which, which really undermines, I mean, a couple of weeks ago we were talking, I think it was about Chilton, about how the book of Revelation is all about the judgment of Jerusalem or something like that. Well, not if you're paying attention to Ezekiel 2, 9, and 10, which John was, you're, you're, you're sort of misreading the book, you know, just, in, in, and this one point establishes that it's a misreading. But anyway. If you look at Ezekiel's preaching more widely, the book of Ezekiel, you realize that he does hit both targets in the book. So you have Israel or Judah is the target of judgment in Ezekiel 4 through 24, all those chapters. And after chapter 24, it transitions to the nations, Ezekiel 25 through 32. So in light of the analogy of the scroll in Revelation 5 to that of Ezekiel, it seems reasonable to surmise that the text of the scroll detailed judgments on the unrighteous among both. Jews and Gentiles of the world in opposition to the Lamb and his followers, not just one, but both. And again, we're, we're not doing end time scheme analysis here uh, in this series, but I'll tell you what, just that one observation is going to influence how you read the book. I'm, I'm just saying, just that one thing. Let's go to Isaiah 29, 11. Again, we, we mentioned this briefly you know, the, this is the, the, the passage where we, we get this sealing language. Okay, I'm going to read it again. Isaiah 29, 11. The vision of all this has become to you like the words of a book that is sealed. When men give it to one who can read, saying, read this. He says, I can't, I cannot, for it's sealed. Duh. Okay, how, how am I supposed to read it? It's sealed up. And when they give the book to the one who cannot read, saying, read this, he says, I cannot read. You know, <laughs> so, and, you know, Isaiah is going to go on and, and you use this metaphor to, to, to talk unfavorably. I'm trying to be generous, you know, to the, to those who are the points of reference of the language here. But if we go back to Isaiah 29:11 with the sealing notion there, it's interesting. The sealed book can be read as a metaphor for spiritual blindness. You know, the the, the person who 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 can read can't read this the scroll because it's sealed. Well, again, you you. You don't know. You don't have eyes to see. Remember, you know, you know the, the recurring phrase in the book of Revelation, him that has ears to hear. So you, you also get eyes to see and, you know, th this kind of thing. Well, we, we can't because it's sealed. God doesn't want us to know. Maybe we're being punished. Remember Isaiah 6, which is also a divine counsel scene where God judges the wicked they have ears, but they're not going to be able to hear. They have eyes, but they're not going to be able to see. I mean, some, some scholars take Isaiah 29, 11 as, as a commentary on why the book is sealed here in Revelation 5. You know, again, it's, it's, it's obviously a judgment context in one sense, but is God punishing those who are spiritually blind? Is that, can we read that into it? Again, that, that's, a, that's an item for discussion. I, I don't know that it, that's clear, or but I think it might be possible. I just don't know that it's clear. On the other hand, the referent may also be to Daniel 12, 4, and 9, where a book is deliberately sealed to prevent its content from being known. It doesn't really have, it's not really a commentary on spiritual blindness, it's just preventative. Depending on which trajectory is in view in Revelation 5, the point of the sealed book is either that the blind, the wicked, are about to be hit by a judgment that they will not see coming, or that God has chosen to reveal to the righteous what portends for the future. In other words, the people who are reading the book here, the book of Revelation, and, and they're the righteous, and they will understand. It could be either way, or maybe both. Now, a contemporary text, First Enoch, 
is an apocalypse. That's what First Enoch is. The book of Enoch is an apocalypse designed to inform the righteous that they are about to be vindicated and the wicked judged. And so On picks up on this and he writes of one portion in First Enoch. He says, First Enoch 89.71 refers to a book containing the deeds of the shepherds written by an archangel scribe covering the first historical period from chapter 89 verses 72 to 77, which God himself sealed after it was read out to him. The unsealing and reading of this book in chapter 89, 76 and 77 involves the punishment of the shepherds for what they had destroyed. So again, on saying maybe this is, this is how we should look at Revelation. Again, it's the wicked are going to get blindsided, pardon the pun, and the righteous are going to know. They're, they're going to know, you know what, what's, what's happening, what's coming down the pipe. Let's go to Revelation 5.3. It says, no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. Did you notice the three-tiered cosmology? It's also in chapter 5, verse 13. Vaughn writes, the emphasis is on the beings who populate. Now, just listen to this. You know, three-tiered cosmology, heaven, earth, under the earth. Again, we, if those of you who are familiar with my content, this should be you know, old news by now. The three-tiered cosmology of the Old and New Testament. And on writes, the emphasis is here in Revelation 5 is on the beings who populate each of these three zones. The comprehensive way of referring to each of the three major zones of the cosmos is a way of saying nowhere in the entire universe, okay, nowhere in the entire universe could be found one that was able to open the scroll or to look into it. No supernatural being in the heavens, no earthly being on the earth and no supernatural being or disembodied dead under the earth. Nobody. Interestingly, in the on writes this as well. In the Testament of Solomon, chapter 16, verse 3, Beelzebul is referred to as the ruler of the spirits of the air, which again sounds very New Testament. Ruler of the spirits of the air and the earth and beneath the earth. So Beelzebul is, is given credit over the, again, the, the spiritual beings in all three all three zones who are allied with him. And if that's the case, if, 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 if that's what John intends the reader to think of, basically he's saying none of the spiritual bad guys know what's in this scroll. They're going to get blindsided too, and they are unable to open it and read it. And it's in God's right hand, and only the lamb can open it. In other words, we have some interesting things in store. <laughs> God has some interesting things in store for the powers of darkness, and they don't know. Again, just an interesting thought. Revelation 5, 5 and 6. Again, I'll read it again. One of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered, so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne, the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. These are clear messianic titles. Okay, from the Old Testament, they serve as the means to identify the lamb in the next verse. Again, five and six is tribe of Judah, root of David, then we, then we get the lamb. So they, they, they define who the lamb is. On draws attention to the wording, has conquered. Okay, that's in verse five, Revelation 5, 5. He writes, the use of the term nikon in Greek for the salvific death of Jesus has partial parallels in Paul's allusion to Isaiah 25, 8 in 1 Corinthians 15, 54, which says, death is swallowed up in victory. Victory is nikos. It's a related term to nikon. It's also in John 16, 33 on rights, where the saying is attributed to Jesus, quote, I have conquered the nikeka, the world. And the, the root is the same for all three of these. Revelation 5, 5, 1 Corinthians 15, 54, John 16, 33. Back to On. He says, The atoning death of Christ, conceptualized as conflict resulting in victory, reflects the classic idea of the atonement in which Christ fights against and triumphs over all the evil powers in the world, under whom human beings were in bondage and suffering, and decisively triumphs over them, thereby reconciling the world to himself. Now, here's why I think this is important. You know, we've gotten... Q&A questions about, you know, what's Mike's view of the atonement? You know, is it, is it the ransom? Is it Christus Victor? You know, and my answer is always the same. I don't see any reason that the atonement must be understood 
in only one perspective or, th- or from only one perspective. Usually people want to argue for other views of the atonement just to get away from substitutionary atonement. That is a mistake. It is a theological mistake and a theological error. How can I say that with confidence here? Because this is the lamb okay, who was slain and now is standing. It's resurrection imagery. It's death and resurrection. Death and resurrection are linked to has conquered. And the has conquered is linked to, again, victory over, not only victory over, over supernatural darkness, but, but the, the reconciliation of the cosmos to God. You can't have that with other views of the atonement. In other words, you can't exclude the idea of the death from the atonement concept You can't do it, so why are you trying so desperately to do it? Because it's culturally offensive or something like that? Well, sorry, it's it's in the text. It's not just here, it's in the text and other places. So, again, I think this debate over the atonement is kind of useless. It's a distraction. We can learn something about the atonement from all of the possible perspectives. They all have a a contribution to make. That's all I'm saying. We don't need to, to embrace some other one just to get rid of substitutionary atonement. That's a, that's deeply flawed thinking. Okay. Why does the imagery of the lamb appear here? Move on to another topic. The term used here, Arneon, occurs 29 times in the book of Revelation, all of which are references to Jesus, except for Revelation 13, 11. The only other New Testament occurrence is John 21, 15. So, I mean, think Arneon, the word for lamb here in Revelation 5, occurs 29 times in the book of Revelation. They all refer to Jesus except the one in Revelation 13, 11. That's really about the beast and the, you know, it's drawing on Daniel with with the ram and all that stuff. The only other occurrence is John 21, 15. Now, the word used in John 1, 29, because a lot of you are thinking, what about John 1, 29, the lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world? That's a different word. That's amnos. Okay, it's also in John 1, 36, Acts 8, 32, 1 Peter 1, 19. So on really gets into this. He devotes seven pages of discussion to the Greek terminology for lamb found in the New Testament and the Septuagint, as well as the Aramaic equivalents. So, you know, I'm not going to go through all that. But I, I, just a few of his observations here, I think, are, are interesting. He writes, the term arneon, lamb, occurs 29 times again in Revelation, only in 13.11 does the term not refer to Jesus. Rather, it refers there to the beast from the land or the false prophet. With the first occurrence of Arneon being in Revelation 5.6, the only other New Testament occurrence of the term is John 21.15, where the plural form, ta arnia, is a metaphor referring to the Christian community. Lambs. Okay. Many commentators have observed that Arneon is the term preferred in Revelation, while Amnos is preferred in the Gospel of John where it occurs just twice, John 1.29, John 1.36. There are two primary ways of interpreting the lamb metaphor in Revelation, either as a metaphor for a leader or ruler or, or, or as a sacrificial metaphor. So it's either the, the lamb terminology can either be metaphorically speaking of a leader or ruler or of a sacrificial victim, okay? While the desig- this is back to on now. While the designation lamb is in some respects synonymous with the term Messiah in Revelation, there's only one single disputed instance in which the figure of the lamb is used of the Messiah in early Jewish literature. Testament of Joseph 9.3. Uh, I would actually disagree with that, but anyway, I'm not going to worry about that too much. We may be having an episode of the podcast later on where we get into the, this issue again with the, the Josephite Messiah thing. We were you know, we, we may get an opportunity to do that. I don't, it, w- it would be an interview. But anyway, back to the quote. Apart from this one text, there's no convincing evidence that the Messiah was symbolized by a lamb in Second Temple Judaism. Again, I would disagree with that, but moving on. The first mention of the lamb in Revelation follows his introduction as the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David in Revelation 5.5, 5, both clearly messianic designations. The lamb is depicted as a mighty warrior able to conquer those who make war against him. 1714. All who oppose the lamb, regardless of station, fear his wrath. Revelation 616. The role of the lamb in judgment is suggested by the mention of the lamb's book of life. 137. It is clear that the sacrificial associations of the lamb have no obvious connection with these more violent and powerful activities of the lamb. 
sheep were often used to the ancient Near East as, a, as ways of depicting the gods. Isn't that interesting? Or as symbols for the gods. This is especially true in Egypt, but I'm skipping all that stuff. On, on gets into it, but it's just too long. Back to On. He says, some of the references to the lamb in Revelation clearly point to the sacrificial death of Jesus. So again, here he's saying, look, sometimes, you know, this, this metaphor in the ancient world refers to, to deities, or, you know, conquering heroes. And sometimes it's very obviously a, a sacrificial thing, a sacrificial animal. And he says, some of the references clearly point to the sacrificial death of Jesus in Revelation. The lamb who is standing and has seven horns and seven eyes looks as though it had been slain. The consequence of the slaughter of the lamb, doubtless referring to the crucifixion of Jesus, was the redemption by means of his blood. In other words, his death, Revelation 5, 9 and 7, 14. In Revelation 12, 11, it is said that the people of God conquered Satan by the blood of the lamb. Okay, there we go again with the atonement thing. This is just me breaking in here. It is deeply flawed to try to exclude substitutionary atonement from the picture of, of the atonement, the work of Christ. Every perspective of the atonement has something to contribute. Okay, John is very, he has, very obviously has his head in the sacrificial aspect here. But that's not the only aspect. Again, that, that's the point I'm trying to, to make clear here. Back to on. He says, Jesus is referred to under the metaphor of a sacrificial sheep or lamb in a number of other New Testament and early Christian texts. The earliest reference is found in 1 Corinthians 5, 7. In John 1, 29, Jesus is referred to as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The phrase Lamb of God is applied to Jesus again in John 1, 36, a title taken by most scholars to refer to the Paschal, the Passover Lamb, even though the expiation of sin was not linked to the Passover sacrifice. Hope you realize that as well. Passover was not about the forgiveness of sin. It was about saving the Israelites from death, from the destroyer. Other scholars have observed the Aramaic term for lamb, talia. Remember the, the passage, talitha, okay, talia. Talia can mean child or servant. It can also mean lamb. And it was interpreted in the latter sense in John 1, 29, 36, based on Isaiah 53, 7. That's the end. I mean, uh, it, like I said, he goes on for seven pages of this. And, you know, I just wanted to give you a little bit of a taste of it. But, but the lamb metaphor, here's the bottom line. The lamb metaphor can work two ways. Not only one way. Okay, the, the, the sacrificial aspect of the metaphor which is linked to the atonement, which is linked to, to victory over, you know, Satan in Revelation 12. Okay, all these things, okay, that, that's one side of the metaphor and they cannot be excluded. The other side, again, there are passages that talk about Talia, servant. When you hear servant and, it, and, you, and you, oh, in Aramaic, the, the word for, for lamb can also mean servant. That should make you think of Jesus in yet another way, the servant, you know, servant songs, Isaiah, you know, I mean, the, Metaphors are like this. They're multivalent. There's your academic word for the day. Multivalent means they can have more than one meaning, different aspects to it. And, and this is a good example of it, this whole lamb thing. It includes sacrifice. It includes servant. It includes, you know, even, even deity, okay, because of the wider ancient Near East, you know, we're, we're gods, we're, we're, we're given this terminology, rulership. It includes all these things. And John, again, the suggestion is, by on, John uses it in more than one way. So we need to be thinking about this when we read through the book. So I would say, again, just in summary here, it is likely secure, at least, to say that the lamb metaphor pointing to rulership is in view for John, but that does not exclude the sacrificial, particularly since John portrays the lamb as slain. So he's doing both. We should not then think only of a lamb being led to slaughter in its weakness. When you read through the book of Revelation about the lamb and you get this, you know, sort of pathetic description of the lamb who was slain and, you know, you know, don't think of it as an object of weakness. Okay, yes, it's a sacrificial victim, but at the same time, it's a conquering ruler. And that is actually bound up in the metaphor, believe it or not. So let's try to not read it one way. Okay, further, while the Passover lamb reference for Jesus is clear in Paul's letter to the Corinthians, it's not as clear in John's writings, at least the specific Passover connection. 
lambs were used in a wide range of sacrifices in the Old Testament. Could be some other sacrifice to, to loop in as far as the meaning of it. Consequently, without a specific reference to Passover by John, the options for why John might be drawing on the language are wide open. The two trajectories merge in the two aspects of Christ's mission broadly, to bring humanity back into relationship with God and more narrowly in prospect to judge the world. The lamb, as a metaphor, is appropriate for both sides of that, is the point. So, again, these are just a few things in Revelation 5. Again, you know, especially the lamb thing, you know, all just goes on and on and on and on with illustrations and whatnot. It'd be wonderful, you know, if we could, you know, spend the time going through his examples. They're, they're, they're very interesting. They're very telling. But I think that's enough, again, for, for the sake of this episode and the podcast. Again, the goal here was to pick out some of the things in Revelation 5 that have a connection in some way to the Old Testament. Again, it, It'd be nice if we could go through all of the sacrifices in the Old Testament that use a lamb. You know, might John be thinking of this? Maybe, maybe not. He, he's not specific, but we're not, we're not going to do that. We need to move on to chapter six next week. But just again, keep in mind, again, that, that when John uses this image, he means more than one thing. He's traveling down more than one river. Okay. He's, <laughs> he's, he's, he's assuming that readers will know, oh, Okay, I could, John might want me to think this or that, and maybe both. It just depends. Again, there's, there's a, lot of, a lot of that kind of thing going on in Revelation 5, and of course, as we proceed to Revelation 6 next week, you know, we're going to get into some more of these things as the seals are opened. There's, there's going to be a lot more dipping into the Old Testament with, uh, again, to provide context for what we're reading. All right, Mike, I'm excited to open the first seal next week. That'll be good. <laughs> See what yeah. happens. Hopefully bring, we can find sharp instrument or somebody <laughs> worthy enough to open it. Do you think we will? I mean, there's spoilers. Do we, do we want to, uh, is, is this, is this like a promotion? Is it, I, I never know what you're thinking. Trey. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't either, Mike. I don't either. I don't know what that means. Uh, yeah. All right. Sounds good. Well, we'll be looking forward uh, to chapter six next week. And uh, with that, I want to thank you everybody for listening to the Naked Bible podcast. God bless. Thanks for listening to the Naked Bible Podcast. To support this podcast, visit www.nakedbibleblog.com. To learn more about Dr. Heiser's other websites and blogs, go to www.drmsh.com.